All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. So th right, this next tutorial is going to be on networking technologies for high performance computing principles and solutions um, given by Thabaleshwa Panda and Hari Sumaroni. I know you have all already been introduced for a previous tutorial, but just in case anyone wasn't there, I want to do a quick introduction that uh, Dr. Panda is a professor of computer science and engineering and a university distinguished scholar at The Ohio State University. He has published over 500 papers in major journals and international conferences related to his research areas. Dr. Pender, Dr. Panda and his research group members have been doing extensive research on modern networking technologies. Dr. Panda and his team have been actively working on high performance MPI and PGAS libraries, deep learning libraries, and big data libraries. And Dr. Panda is an IEEE fellow and a member of ACM. Dr. Hari, Hari Subramoni is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at The Ohio State University. He has published over 100 papers in international journals and conferences. He has been actively involved in various professional activities in academic journals and conferences. Um, I think that was a typo. Dr. Subramoni is doing research on the design and development of Mbopich 2 and Mbopich 2X. Sorry, I'm missing some of this introduction. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, so, I appreciate it. Thank you for the kind introduction. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very so, much. And we look forward to this tutorial. Yeah, so, so thanks Amanda for the kind of introduction and um, uh, welcome all of you to this afternoon version of the tutorial. Uh, uh, some of you were there in the morning version. There we focused more onto the deep learning, machine learning, uh, middleware, the challenges. Uh, but here we'll go into much more details, but this will be a very uh, overview of principles and solutions of high performance interconnects. So we are at the hot interconnect conference. So, so we'll be trying to take a look at all the different kinds of issues and challenges. The slides are available here. Those who are joining, uh, please uh, download a copy of the slides from this location. It has been posted onto the uh, onto the chat. Uh, we also have a Slack channel. Uh, that link also has been posted there. So, so you can actually ask us questions uh, either through the chat um, or through the Slack channel. Uh, but before we go into a little bit more details, um, I know this is after lunch, at least in the West Coast. If a few of you can introduce yourself. Uh, and tell us a little bit about um, uh, your background, what you are working on, and why are you interested in this tutorial? Uh, it will help us. Any volunteer? You can unmute yourself and then just talk. No? No volunteer? Uh, yeah, hi, this is Paul Congdon. Uh, okay. I'm a uh, IEEE, uh, senior IEEE member, uh, worked on uh, um, standards in IEEE 802.1 related okay. to congestion control uh, for high performance computing. Okay, nice. Um, anybody else would like to briefly introduce yourself? Okay, um, if not, we'll, we'll get started and then um, gradually over a period of the next three hours, we'll try to know each other and uh, and if you have any questions, we'll be very happy to answer. So the tutorial will go like this. This is the overview. Um, we'll start with a very high level introduction, why high performance networking, and then we'll try to separate it out like saying what happens below the network and what happens above. And of course, there is a communication model and semantics, which sits on it. It's just like, you know, the instruction set architecture kind of thing. So this is what we'll try to define that. And then as many of you know, I mean, there are a lot of different networks these days. Um, we'll start with the common ones, uh, like the infinite band, high-speed ethernet, uh, how, what has happened in the convergence and some of their features. And then once we know some of the basic principles and, and the features of these networks, we'll try to bring the additional networks We'll not go into very details, but we'll be able to compare and contrast. So in those contexts, we'll try to introduce OmniPath architecture, NB-Link and NB-Switch architecture from NVIDIA. Um, some of you might be knowing the Amazon has its own interconnect. Uh, it's called Elastic Fabric Adapter. 
so that's what we'll be going. And then finally, we'll be going over the clink slingshot, Cray slingshot. That is the architecture which is used in the number one system, like the frontier. Now, these are mostly like the interconnects as they are going. going um, there is a lot of focus nowadays towards smart NICs. And we'll take example of one of these. Uh, is called the data center processing unit uh, from um, NVIDIA. That's called the DPU architecture. So we'll take a look at that in more details. And then once we have got a reasonably exposure here, we'll also try to take a look at the upper level software stats, like a, how the upper level programs or the middlewares can actually utilize the features. In that context, there are two common software stacks. Um, uh, some of you might be knowing there was an OFED, Open Fabrics Enterprise Distribution, we'll introduce that. But the other two common ones which are used uh, are called UCX and Leaf Fabrics. So we'll go into those. And then towards the end, we'll try to take a look at some of the sample case studies and performance numbers, just to get a feel um, how these uh, uh, networks uh, behave in terms of latency, bandwidth, some sample numbers, but not in a very exhaustive manner. Um, so that will give you a very uh, broad idea of where we stand today. So if you take a look at a very high level, like a high performance computing, you know, I mean, we are in a very exciting phase. Uh, the growth is happening both in processor performance, uh, but not individual processor core, but the chip density, as you know, like the number of cores for uh, socket, uh, for the node are steadily increasing. So that is giving to a lot of performance from a single node. And then once we try to build the system using a lot of these nodes, then we need high performance networking. Okay, so these are being put together um, to design and develop a lot of these HPC systems. Uh, and when I say node, it, it utilizes both CPU, GPU, we'll consider that kind of a single node. So in that context, the clusters have become very popular choice, uh, focusing on scalability, modularity, upgradability. And you see here like some representative applications like a, let's say crash dynamics or uh, nuclear simulation, bioinformatics. So those are the kind of the standard traditional applications. Of course, we are moving into the AI and all we'll be introducing very soon. Now, one interesting thing we need to take a look when I said computing cluster, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this top 500.org. Uh, this is the, the ranking of the top 500 systems um, twice a year, once in supercomputing in the November, uh, in another three months, we'll see that. And another one happened like two months back, uh, in, in uh, three months back actually in, in, in Germany at ISC. Now, what it's trying to show, this is like the historical X axis, and this is the Y axis, the number of those cluster, out of those 500, how many are commodity clusters? That's what it's trying to say. So when I say commodity, the definition is like, I mean, if you have money, you can go and buy uh, uh, CPUs, GPUs, networking, uh, storage, everything you memory, then you put it together. Okay, so that is the definition of commodity. There is an interesting trend here. If you see in the very old days, if some of you remember that time, like uh, people were talking about Cray XMP, Cray YMP, uh, connection machines, those were not commodity. That means you cannot go and put together that yourself. These used to be from a given vendor. But then over the years, you see the latest number is like a 98.2%. Okay, that means most of the systems currently have our commodity. So if as an organization, uh, or if you, even if you are a person like Elon Musk or something who has a lot of money, you can buy actually um, all these different components, CPUs, GPUs, networks, and put it together. There are a lot of open source software. Uh, and then you have your own cluster or on an SPC for AI. That's what is the current state of the art. Now, when we say computing cluster for SPC, most of people have this figure in the left side in mind. That means I'm just running some traditional SPC applications. But actually the cluster definition is very wide in the sense you can also have these days, you know, many of the applications, big data, AI and all, they operate on very large set of data. So you cannot fit that all those data into a single node. So you have actually a storage cluster also. So here, if you see within these, say you have like a parallel file systems like a Luster, GPFS. So, so this itself in a physical manner, if you see there are a bunch of servers and there's some kind of a switch. 
then of course this is the most common these days this is the data center so data center is also is a cluster it, it is built with commodity components um, if you look at like let's say amazon you are trying to purchase something like amazon.com as soon as you type it your request actually goes to a front end server in your locality okay like for example i'm in columbus as soon as it's amazon.com through my isp provider it goes to the nearest front end server so then i try to do some search my request gets moved to the tier two that is like your app server uh, if i am looking for a book it goes and then gives me some answers saying yeah, there are so many used copies so many news copies it gives me a lot of statistics like uh, x percentage of people like this book they also purchased y it gives me some ads so all those things happens from the app server so then if i want to decide to purchase then that request moves to the database server that is like a kind of a tier three and this is where it is asking for all your credit cards addresses uh, it performs the transaction uh, in the back end and then sends you a thank you note saying, look, thanks for purchasing your delivery. This is your tracking number and it will be delivered by such and such time. So, and, and here if you see again, in a physical manner, I need a lot of servers and some kind of switch and networking. Okay. So irrespective of whether you are in this, this or this, physically they are commodity clusters. Okay. Like you just buy a bunch of these servers, bunch of these um, network switches, adapters, and the network links, and put them together with appropriate functionalities. Okay. Now, interestingly, you can also have integrated systems. So think of like a bank. So the bank might have a front-end data center through which you are performing your like accounts, transactions, those kind of things. And behind the things, the bank might be also trying to find out how much money they have in the reserve, how much they should uh, modeling the financial market, how much they should invest. So, so all those data can be also shared. And many of these companies these days, international companies, they have geographically distributed clusters and they are actually working over local area network, wide area network. So we need to keep this very broad picture in mind because when we talk about networking, they can be used in any of these places. Of course, they have different features, they have different um, uh, costs. That's what we'll be talking as we move along. Then, of course, nowadays we get a lot of um, cloud computing. I mean, a lot of things are moving into the cloud. So the idea is very similar. Whatever we have on the on-premise, we can also have it in the cloud. The only difference being instead of physical machines, these are virtual machines. And similarly, instead of a file system, you have a virtual network file system. But oh, the, the basic logical structure but the physical structure remains the same, like a bunch of servers connected with high performance networking and some kind of a switch. So then if you go into different different domains here, I'll try to show some examples like the data analytics. It has been there for many years. Big data analytics traditionally started with Hadoop. Things have moved over Spark. The idea is very similar. I have a bunch of nodes and then I'm trying to, the data is sitting on the different nodes in a in a parallel manner. And I try to do like a traditional map reduce operation or HBase operation. So these model scales well, but once the data size increases, you need good kind of a network support to, to make sure that the your job is running in a very scalable manner. So then of course we have in this phase of deep learning, machine learning, today morning we discussed quite a lot here, um, the whole field of AI, there is a subset field is the machine learning. There is a smaller subset deep learning. Nowadays, nowadays we have access to a lot of uh, data, all the different kinds of models, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Uh, we need to do the training. Um, the classic example is the chat GPT, as you would have seen. Uh, the chat GPT has been trained with uh, over a period of like several months with a multi-billion parameters, and you need enough computing power. Okay, and those are actually also they have been run on the commodity clusters kind of things. So, so we'll keep that very broad view. And then if you are a, an architect from a networking point of view or an IO point of view, if I ask you, okay, write down the kind of the requirements, uh, your list may look like this, okay? So that means the first we'll start with a good system area networks with excellent performance, okay? Because we are talking about high performance computing, performance is important. Now, if you go back in the performance here, I introduced three metrics. One is a latency, bandwidth, <clears throat> and the third one is CPU utilization. Now, latency has been there for many, many years, almost like the beginning of the computer networking is like how much time does it take to send some data from a node A to node B, 
okay typically short messages you send a message you get the reply back it's like a half of round trip then you say it is a latency the next one is bandwidth and this is good for very large data so if there are two nodes the rate at which i can pump data from one node to the other node to keep the network pipe full these two metrics have been there for many years over the last 20 years there is a third metric which has been introduced called cpu utilization okay so what does that mean so this cpu utilization is not for your application but for network protocol processing okay and that's what actually we'll, we'll go into very in depth and that's what we'll separate out um, the different kinds of uh, uh, networking technologies. Uh, for So the idea here is that let's say we'll introduce different protocols, how much there is some overhead, somebody has to do the work. Like let's say take some data from the memory, put them into packet, send it over the network. The other side you have to uh, again um, uh, analyze the packet, take the data. So these are called the network protocol processing. Now the question is, who does that? Okay, uh, does the CPU do it, or you offload it? Okay, and let's let me give you an example. So let's say I have two networks, which is which have equal latency, equal bandwidth, but the network protocol processing overhead or the CPU utilization of one network is fifteen percent, the other network is five percent. Okay, let's say A is fifteen percent, B is five percent. Which one is better? Any idea, any quick answer? Is my question clear? I mean, you can post an answer on the chat also. People are very silent today. This is the last day of the conference. People are tired also, okay? okay. So your answer will be, yeah, B. B is only taking 5%, okay? So what it means that if only the 5% of the CPU is used lights for network protocol processing, then 95% of the cycles are left. Your application will run better compared to 15% because in that case, only 85% of the cycles are left. But then you may need to bring, I mean, we'll keep that in mind and come to the last entry, which is the cost, okay? How much does that cost? That network B is a price performance, is that effective or not? So we'll, we'll come back to that question. So this is the good system area networks. Then similarly, we need good storage area networks because data these days, we are operating on huge data. We need a good high performance IO. Similarly, you also need good wide area network connectivity uh, because as you saw in the one of the earlier picture, these clusters are being deployed many different regions. So I also need to have good wide area network connectivity. We also need good quality of service. This is also becoming important it's just like the quality of service has been there for many years. Uh, the field of networking, people have been working on a lot of solutions. Many of the solutions traditionally were based on uh, software. But now the question is becoming like, think of your Amazon in the data center. The question is, if you are a very frequent buyer from Amazon, can they make sure that your request gets the highest priority? Okay. It is just like, you know, the, our airport travels, I'm sure some of you are very diamond medallion and, gold medallion, silver medallion, TSA, clear, you know, all these um, facilities are there. And depending on your status, uh, how much you are, and you can move through the airport very quickly. Similar ideas are coming to the data centers. Okay, so, uh, so you log on to your Amazon account, as soon as they detect that, oh, you are the most highest uh, purchaser, your request will move or be given higher priority compared to other people. Okay, so that is the kind of things they are trying to provide service starting from the hardware to even to the software in an integrated manner. So then the question is reliability, availability, serviceability or called RAS. This is also very important. I mean, 20 years back when some nodes used to fail, people used to say, yeah, yeah, we'll go and fix it in the night. Okay, but, but these days there is no concepts of night. I mean, these data centers are running 24 by 7, 365. People are interacting with them from all different time zones. Uh, different countries. So even if the data center goes down for half an hour, all these big companies lose money. So so you need to provide this kind of RAS capabilities while the system is continuously running. Okay. So these are the kind of the features. And then the question is, okay, with how much cost? Okay. Because everybody is trying to 
if you are an end organization, um, you might be trying to reduce the cost for average query or for an average program to run. So the everything is being put together and, and everybody wants all these features with the lowest cost. Okay? And this is where there is competition and all these different vendors are coming up with different features. When I say vendors, networking vendors, that is the context of this tutorial and coming up with different features. And, and then you as an end user or as an end system integrator, you need to ask yourself saying, which network is the best for you, for your workload or your usage pattern, okay? So that's what we'll see as we go through the features, gradually these networks will be um, separated out. Any quick question at this time? Are these requirements overview clear? Okay, I'm assuming it is okay. So now let's move. We'll start with a very simple, like a think like you are in a computer architecture 101 class, okay? I'm sure you have done this class at some time in, in your career. So this is how a system looks like. I have a server. I have some processors, uh, multiple cores, I have a memory systems. Typically it is connected with an IO bus. It could be PCI, uh, PCI Express, or in the recent context, people have been talking about CXL, all those things can be there. Then you have a network adapter. It could be an ethernet or InfiniBand or a slingshot, and then you get connected to a network switch. So these are all the hardware components. And then there is a software component, which is a communication stack, which actually works or touches with all these components, interacts with the firmware, interacts with the driver, and takes care of moving data, okay? From a sender to a receiver, like a point to point, or one sender to a lot of servers, like a broadcast or collect, or reduce, all reduce, all those things happen above this, okay? So in that context, what happens, because these are commodity components, let's say you are trying to deploy a system in January, 2024, and you are shopping around, so you may get some kind of processing technology, some kind of memory technology, some IO adapter and switch technology. So you need to go and then put them together. And you may come and see that all these components that performance may not be matching all together. Okay, some might have better performance, some might have lower performance, but when you put it together, there could be different kinds of bottlenecks. Okay, so we'll introduce three kinds of bottlenecks. So one will be the processing bottleneck, Another will be IO interface bottleneck and then fire. Um, sorry, it looks like uh, Dr. Panda's uh, internet may have uh, frozen uh, a, a little. So uh, let me uh, start uh, sharing. Give me a, a moment, please. Uh, sorry for the uh, technical uh, trouble. So, uh, I think he's back. Let's give it just a moment uh, to lock back on. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, you need to reshare your slides, up Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't know what happened here. Sorry. Uh, give give me one minute. You want to teach it? Now she's done. Mm. Uh, Harry, stand up, please. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we are talking about these uh, different kinds of bottlenecks. So, so then let's take a look at the first bottleneck, which is the processing bottleneck. And, and this is the traditional kind of like the TCP IP, UDP IP. Uh, they have in the communication networking protocol. For, for many, many years. And uh, so these are generic architectures. So if you take a look at the, the, uh, the typical protocols um, in the TCP IP stack, you will see that you try to, like uh, there are multiple like uh, layered protocols at the host processor, you need to take care of data buffering, integrity, checksum, routing. Uh, there are multiple layers and then the data moves between multiple layers so both on the center side and on the receiver side. And once you have that, then what happens is, there is a lot of overhead, even though I'm sending like a one byte or two bytes, it goes through all these layers and keeps on adding overhead.
Okay, um, le let me uh, uh, present from there. Hold on for a second, please. I apologize for the uh, technical issues. Uh, so, um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Brown, do you want to go? I, I can remove the slides. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I don't know. Morning, everything worked fine. I don't know uh, what exactly is happening. Uh, I turned off my video. Um, That's okay. okay. Yeah, so 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 here if you see, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we're talking here. So this is like kind of the last mile bottleneck. And um, when the COVID started, doesn't matter like what happens to the outside world, the, the link which comes in and out, um, that determines the overall performance, okay? So, so that is the kind of the things what we'll be talking here. That is like kind of the last mile bottlenecks. And, and in the very old days, if you go, like this is a PCI, almost in this day, uh, started in 1990. If you take a look, those who are familiar, it used to bus. Like it is a 33 megahertz, 32 bit. If you do a multiplication, it is like a one gigabits per second. And it's like a bus. So you have 32 bits and every bit is, is operating like a 33 megahertz. So all together, we can send it at a 1.05 gigahertz per second. Of course, we can increase the throughput by either increasing the clock speed or increasing the bus width. These are the two degrees of parameter. And that's what happened like in 1998, 2003, PCI-X was introduced, okay? And, and then it moved to 8.5 gigabits per second, 17 gigabits per second. But this solution was not scalable. If those of you know like a basic electronics and all, if I have a, a lot of lines and every line is moving very fast, there will be crosstalks between these lines. There will be skews. So there will be big issues about the signal integrity. And that's what people found out that they cannot keep on putting like a thousand bits of line or operating at a one gigabits per second. People found out the limitations. Next slide, please. So then the third one is like the network bottlenecks, okay? So it doesn't matter like how you put together the single node, but when it goes to outside and when you connect a lot of servers, how much effective bandwidth or how the network operates, okay? So here we have a small table. If you take a look like ethernet uh, started in 1979, okay? So it's almost what, like a 65 years back. It was only 10 megabits per second. And the world was very happy for 14 years. Nobody, wanted a faster speed, the reason being there was no applications, okay? It was only like a being used by DARPA or some military agencies to send some information back and forth. We didn't have any iPhone that time or any uh, real time uh, FaceTime or none of those things. But gradually as the systems got developed, people kept on seeing that, okay, there is a much more demand is needed. So that's how we moved to gigabit ethernet 1995, there was a technology called asynchronous transfer mode. It was introduced in 1995. That technology came from the um, uh, communication field. Um, then the first actual cluster computing technology was introduced in 1993 by Mericom. Uh, this is a company, uh, uh, you know, Bill Daly's advisor, Chuck Size from Caltech. He had the first, that is a wormhole routing networks, which was actually Bill Daly's thesis, who is currently the NVIDIA's uh, uh, CTO. So that's how the wormhole networking first came. So there were like a really, you can buy commodity switch. You can buy a four port switch, eight port switch, cables. Uh, there was a Miracom adapter and you can connect them that time to sun machines. Those of old people know, uh, sun solar servers and all you can put together and that will be like your uh, cluster. And that used to be called like a networks of workstations. Okay, that's how the terminology started. And then gradually it moved to fiber channel, which was like a 1994 with respect to the stories. Next slide, please. So, so, so we are coming like the previous slide, you saw like almost the end of 90s. And then gradually there was a much more higher and higher demand. So this is where a lot of industry tried to participate and come up with some standards so that we can continue over the years. And in that context, two technologies were 
or two consortium started. One is InfiniMan. We'll talk about that. And then also the high speed Ethernet. And since InfiniMan was totally new, it aimed to have all the three bottlenecks, like a protocol processing bottleneck, IO bottleneck, and network speed. But Ethernet was already there. So it directly tried to handle the network speed bottleneck, but tried to depend on complementary technologies to alleviate the protocol processing bottlenecks. So now let's go and then see what that means. Okay. Any questions so far before I move? Uh, so Dr. Pan, a quick thing. Uh, can you see if you're able to control the slides with your um, yeah. uh, like uh, arrow keys? Yeah, yeah, that's what um, I know I got a message. Do I need to claim it or? Yeah, probably. Mm. I I do um, re request remote control. No, like I um I have yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. 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 I I can control now. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, so this is the first one is the InfiniMan Trade Association. So this was formed with uh, the seven industry leader, as you can see it here. Um, some of them don't exist and there have been a lot of merging and all. But the, you see the definition, the goal was to design a scalable and high performance communication and networking architecture by taking an integrated view of computing network and storage technology. It was not just networking. It was an integrated view they wanted to take. And many other industry participated in that effort. Um, if you remember like the InfiniMan, the first volume was introduced in October 2000. And then over the years, as newer and newer, as the deployment started happening, people found out bottlenecks, people found out issues in the standard. So that's why a lot of several annexes were released. The list is here. And, and as of now, like the latest version is like a 1.6, uh, which has been like a last year, a summer was introduced. You can actually go to this site, uh, register yourself. It is free, download the InfiniMan uh, specification, this specification. But to be aware, it is actually 1700 pages, 1700, okay? So that shows the complexity of this like a open networking standard because it goes into a lot of very details. But of course, I mean, we don't have time here. We'll not be able to cover you all 1700 pages, but we'll just touch some high level concepts so that you get an idea of what this networking technology is and what are the kind of the, the, the features it has. So similarly, once InfiniMan started, a similar consortium also started with high-speed Ethernet. And this is where like prior to that, we had the one gigabit Ethernet consortium. So then they tried to design the 10 gigi alliance. And the goal was very similar, as you can see, to achieve a scalable and high-performance communication architecture. But the one of the focus was to have actually the uh, having backward compatibility with, with Ethernet. And then what happened, a lot of the interesting things have happened in this field over the last uh, 20 years. Even though 10 gigi was formed, you know, the Ethernet go back like a 10 megabits, 100 megabits, one gigabits, 10 gigabits, a natural progression was to jump from 10 to 100, okay? But if you take a look at, it is not just changing the network, like our earlier example, if you just change the network field, you will not network speed, you don't get the benefit. Your uh, IO interface has to be improved. Your protocol processing has to be improved. Then only you can see the effective 100 gig uh, bandwidth. And, and that time people saw that, oh, this is not possible. So then what happened actually, Ethernet consortium went at one, a little bit back step. They introduced the intermediate speed called 40 gigabits per second. Okay, and that time, like we'll see in the next slide, uh, InfiniMan had moved to a QDR technology, which is like a quad data rate. So they were able to, uh, InfiniMan was able to, the IO interface was able to support 40 gigi, and the similar technology was helpful to actually on the ethernet to bring 40. So then that was also very expensive. And, and then we'll see another development started, starting from July, 2024, to go one step even back, uh, to have 25 gigabits per second, okay? And we'll very soon introduce a concept of a lane and then you will see what that means. So nowadays actually they were like a convergence taking place, the similar hardware, similar fabric, similar network adapter, not exact adapter, but in a physical uh, like a cables, those kind of things are being used both across InfiniMan and 10 gigi, uh, sorry, not 10 gigi, high-speed ethernet. And then you see all these solutions. 
10 gigi, 25, 40, 50, 100, 200, 400. Okay, so, so we have a range of uh, Ethernet solutions are available. And, and of course, Ethernet, there is always a roadmap continuously being enhanced. So you can take a look at this link and you will see uh, what is happening. So now with that overview, now let's see what exactly happened. Why suddenly now we are seeing all these improvements and we'll go back to those three bottlenecks again. What new solutions have been proposed with respect to network speed, protocol processing, and IO interface, and how they have helped us. So the first thing we'll start with this network uh, bottleneck alleviation. Um, the, the way InfiniMan started, if you actually go into details and read, InfiniMan is a word which comes from two words, have been joined together. And what it means that infinite bandwidth. Okay, that's how the word was coined. What does that mean actually? I mean, there is nothing like an infinite bandwidth. But what the idea was that, you remember that PCI, PCI-X were bus-based systems and then there was a crosstalks and all. So fundamentally, they wanted to change this into a bit serial differential signaling. Okay, so the idea was that instead of a bus, they will have independent pairs of wires to transmit independent data called a lane. Okay, so you can have a like an independent one pair of wires and send data in a sequential manner. Okay, and then if you can have that, you can have any number of lanes. Okay, so now you have the same two degrees of freedom. I can have any number of lanes, and within each lane, I can actually control the speed. And if I can do that, then depending on the demand, I can keep on increasing the number of lanes or increase the 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 bandwidth of an individual lane. And then I'll get this, there should not be any perceived limit on the bandwidth and that's how we can get that infinite speed, okay? So now let's take a concrete look how that happened. So this, this table, if you see this, this is the InfiniMan 2000, the standard came. The first product came here in InfiniMan 2, 2001. And then here you will see there are two terminology. One is called 1X, that means it was a one lane and the technology is SDR like a single data rate. So what they mean that the, the within the same link, in one clock cycle, I can only send one bit, okay? That was the principle, then they had only one lane. And the rate at which they were sending the data is actually 2.5 gigabits per second, okay? Not two, but if you know any of the modern networks, like whenever you have some networking, there is a uh, kind of a, you, you have to make sure there is a physical speed and then there is a payload speed. And typically you use some encoding, decoding, so the sender side, you, you encode and the receiver side, you do decode to take care of any bits failures, recovery, those kind of things. So, so the physical speed was actually 2.5, okay? And effectively using eight to 10 encoding, they were getting two gigabits per second. And, and similar time frame, Ethernet was also introduced and they actually used the 12.5 gigabits per second as the physical speed and the payload. So everything here we are referring to as a payload. So they were getting 80, uh, 10 gigabits per second. So in, in two years, the demand increased for the network. So what they had here is, if you see, 4X SDR. So that means the, the link speed remained the same, but instead of having one lane, they put four lanes. And then all these four lanes are put together in a single cable, and that gets connected to the adapter. So, so through that, they were able to increase the bandwidth from two gigabits per second to eight gigabits per second. So then in another two years, there was demand for more network bandwidth. So they went to double data rate or DDR, okay? So that means in the same clock cycle earlier, we were sending one bit. Now the question is, can I send two bits? If I send two bits, the bandwidth doubles. So then we were able to get like eight to 16 gigabits per second. In fact, during that time, IBM actually was very much ahead in InfiniMan. They introduced something called SDR, the SDR, but they had 12 lanes. And, and this is, you remember 2005, we're talking about almost like 18 years before, they were delivering 24 gigabits per second. It was used in some small scale deployment, but these cables were so heavy because you think of like a 12 uh, twisted pair, there was a little bit of engineering flaw in the sense when typical servers, you know, either you have a network adapter connected like this or connected like this, then they have a link. It started like bending the network adapter. So the stability of these systems were were not good. And in that context, that product actually died. Okay. But but effectively it was there. 24 gates per second was there in 2005. So then in 2007, this 
it moved one step ahead. It's called QDR or called quad data rate. That means in one clock cycle, they were able to send four bits. And that led to 32 gigabits per second. And this is the time in 2010, this 40 gigabit was introduced. Okay, so that they can actually utilize the same LAR network adapters and all. So then in, in 2011, this is a little bit odd, but, but the encoding people and the, the people who work at the very lower layer, they were able to come something called a FDR, 14 data rates. It is a little bit odd, not in a power of two. Ideally, you should see like after four, it should go to eight and all, but they were able to squeeze uh, 14 bits um, in a clock cycle. And, and at that time, <clears throat> this encoding, which was eight to 10, that also got improved to 64 to 66. Okay, so they were able to come up with solutions like with using only two additional bits, they were able to uh, achieve that uh, uh, error correction, parity, all those kind of things. So if you do a quick math, 2011, uh, that time the company is called Mellanox, now is a part of NVIDIA, they were able to actually, using one port, they were able to send 54.6 gigabits per second. And then some of these adapters, you know, they have dual ports. So if you do a quick math, so 2012, they were able to at least demonstrate that, look, I can use both the ports in a channel bonding manner, and I can send actually 100 gigabits per second. Uh, in Finiman, then I talked about here, like in the same lane concept, um, Ethernet wanted to introduce or the use one lane. So then they were introducing like a 25 gigabits per second or using two lanes, you can have 50. And then using four lanes, you can come to 100 gigabits per second. Then it kept on moving. Then in 2015, this EDR came. They call it like an enhanced data rate. Then HDR came. So all these are still 4X. Four lanes, but the, the bandwidth in each lane is, is higher and higher. So that came to 100, then came to 200. And then Slingshot, which was introduced. Um, Slingshot is actually a, still a proprietary network. Just to be clear, even though it is being used in a number one system and all, you cannot just go and buy Slingshot for your own lab. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they don't allow that. Uh, they are trying to provide you an integrated system. Then Omnipath Express, that is a commodity network that came 100. Uh, Google had a network uh, for their own cloud provider. That's like 100 gigabits per second. And then this, the very latest one is the NDR, uh, next data rate, they call it. So that is like a 400 gigabits per second. So broadly, you will see that just very quickly, like from 2000 to 2023 now, there has been almost like a 200 times the network bandwidth has improved. And that's what is leading to very exciting phase. And then when we are leaving, uh, people are deploying these systems, people are trying to see the benefits. And that is the main focus of this tutorial. And that's what we'll be um, talking here. Any quick questions on the last slide? There is a lot of data but I just want to get a quick feedback. If anybody has questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Any questions? Um, Hari, any questions on the Slack or anything? Um, no, um, no, no questions on Slack. Okay. So I'll keep moving. So now let's see, this is the pure bandwidth, but how about the latency? Okay, you remember the, that is the protocol processing bottlenecks and, and the overall latency of a message is dependent on the process, protocol processing. And, and over the last, again, 20 years, a lot of developments have taken place here. And the idea leads to something called a defining intelligent network interface card, okay? So, so let me motivate by these common examples. I'm sure some of you are attending are like managers. You, you have some assistants who help you, okay? So if you think of like a, you are an executive and, and you have assistants, so in a day-to-day -day office world, you know, you decide, okay, what can be offloaded to your assistant? What do you do? What the assistant do? So that effectively you can get overlap, you can get efficiency so that the entire, all the jobs get done quickly. Okay. So that is the idea started in almost like a mid nineties. Okay. So people started exploring, can I offload part of my network protocol processing or even entire protocol processing into something called a hardware like a, the name is like a hardware protocol offload engines. And, and if that can be integrated with the network interface card, so my card becomes very intelligent. And then that will give me good performance and it will also allow me the overlap, okay? And that is the reason it will go into the reduced CPU utilization. We talked uh, earlier, 
But to achieve that, you need some kind of a new API, new interface. So in that context, this is what is introduced, something called a user level communication, okay? Or sometimes even known as OS bypass communication. We'll go into that a little bit more detail. And in that case, you don't need signaling between a lot of different layers. All the layers can be implemented on a dedicated hardware unit, not on a shared host CPU. So your overall performance will, will, will improve. We'll go into that detail, very details we'll see. And the third one, of course, is the IO interface bottleneck. So if you remember Inferman, when we said it got introduced, it tried to handle like a networking storage and also the uh, all together as a system. It was like a system level they were trying to handle. So the original idea was that to Inferman was intended to replace the IO bus technology okay, with this bit serial differential signaling at all. But that time in the, in the mid um, uh, 2000, if you remember like a, most of the servers were designed or uh, controlled by uh, Intel. Uh, Intel, you remember that they have something called a front side bus, FSB and all. If you want to bring any networking to the memory system, you need to replace that FSB with Infiniman. And of course, even though Intel was a part of the Infiniman, they didn't like it. Okay, because they had to expose their designs and all they wanted so that um, they wanted to keep their designs proprietary. So that led to actually a big conflicts. If you go back in the literature, you will see that around 2000, 2005, uh, Intel uh, even officially withdrew from Infiniman. Okay. Um, then once uh, Infi Intel withdrew, Microsoft introduced. So there was a lot of turmoil during that time. But interestingly, what was happening during that time the GPU technology was coming up, okay? So, and they also had the same problem. In the very early days, the GPU, even though GPU had the computing power, you need to move the data to, to the GPU, then only you can compute. And they also seeing the similar bottleneck, like how do I move data from memory to the GPU? So Intel was being banged from both ends, from the GPU side, as well as this Infiniman consortium. So in that context, you know, this is a, if those of you are in the Bay Area know this very well, you always try to compete with your competitors, but if something doesn't work out, you join with them, okay? Come up with a new standard. And that's what happened. So, so then Intel changed its strategy and then came up with this PCI Express, okay? Or what is known as PCIe these days. And instead of PCI, it came up with the PCI Express. And, and we'll show you in the next uh, slide what that means. They almost adopted the, all the, the same exact concept. So here, if you see the PCI Express, they introduce the same number of lanes, the, the rate at which you can go. So whatever the Infiniman had the, the two degrees of freedom, they brought the same de two degrees of freedom so that now end to end, you can have, it's not the same, it's not a part of Infiniman, but, but they're using very similar kind of um, concepts. So you can actually, now as over the years, so you have a PCI Express Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5. So these days, completely all the systems use PCI Express, okay? And, and then the other, the servers are being connected. Um, sorry, the network adapter, storage adapter, GPU, all are connected. But then what happened in the last, I think five, six years, even though PCI Express is helping, but uh, go back like a few years back when number one um, summit system was designed in the Oak Ridge, there was a big issue. Um, because GPUs are becoming faster and networking was also becoming faster and PCI Express that time was only limited, I believe, to PCI Express Gen 2 or something like that, okay? So this is where the, the uh, Mellanox that time, Infiniman partnered with NVIDIA, which is a GPU technology and partnered with IBM to come up with systems like a Power 10, Power 9 architecture, not to depend on PCI Express. Okay, so that they can actually deliver that kind of a bigger performance. So there was this consortium. And, and nowadays what is happening is the same thing is continuing because PCI Express like a, even though like there's a consortium, but Intel uh, controls a lot of things there. So there have been a lot of competing, competitors have come like a CCIX, NVLink, that was the NVLink, NVIDIA introduced. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. Then uh, CAPI, Open CAPI, there is a GenG consortium. So a lot of these consortium started to really alleviate that kind of IO interface bottleneck. 
And now in the last two years, all these many other these competitors have joined together and defined something called Compute Express Link or CXL. I'm sure many of you are uh, hearing about this. So this is the next generation link. They are trying to provide a cache coherent interconnect between CPUs, accelerators, GPU, smart IO devices like DPUs. And, and in addition to sending like a message, since it is cache coherent, it is actually allowing even the, you can do read and write from one node to the other node, you can directly read and write so that it will not even go through the, uh, it will go over the CXL in a very fast manner with, with lowest latency, okay? And gradually servers are coming up. Um, many of them are prototypes. I don't think it has become commodity yet, but, but once it happens, um, in fact, recently, this is like a CXL 3.0. That is the very latest standard. They started with 1.0, very quickly moved to 3.0. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, features here uh, that they are claiming. And once that happens, I think that will change the way these servers are designed. You will see very high performance servers, very integrated servers with, with uh, uh, good performance. Okay. So this slide actually provides a very high level overview of CXL 1, 2, and 3 uh, kind of things with different features. And, and this is what like, at least from the standard wise, uh, it is available and we need to actually see the, how the actual systems perform uh, compared to the standard. Any questions here? People are very silent today. Is either everything is getting clear or <laughs> nothing is getting clear? No questions? Clear, okay, good. So next let's try to see, before we go and take a look at the things, we'll try to understand this communication model and semantics, okay? So this is a conceptual thing and, and um, so first let's, uh, sorry. So first what we'll try to introduce is called two-sided communication model, okay? So, so let's say I have two server, I want to send data from here to there. The common one is two-sided, okay? Uh, the next one we'll introduce something called a one-sided. So what does two-sided means? So take a look at an example of the common, like emails, okay? Emails is a two-sided model. That means I can send you an email. The best I know when I say in my Outlook send, I know that the data has been sent. Of course, if it doesn't get received, I can get a reply back saying it got rejected or delivery failed. But as long as you get delivered to your server, email server, you are in control you as a receiver in control. When you read it, how you read it, I don't have any control, okay? I might have sent an email, if you are a vacation, you are not reading your email, I will not get a reply back. Or even though you are reading my email, the decision completely lies with you what to do with that email, okay? You, you might uh, think of, wow, Dr. Parna's email has come, I should immediately reply, or you should say, I hate Dr. Parna, forget about it, delete, okay? So, so the control totally lies with you. And that's what happens here, two-sided communication, okay? So in a computer system, so what we are trying to see here, like a three bars, P1, P2, P3, and the, the dotted ones are like a host channel adapter or think of like this, uh, your NIC. So in these high-speed networks, <clears throat> most of the time, what you try to do before you receive, you want to receive a message, you need to have a post receive buffer, okay? In our email example, it says that, okay, your mailbox should have enough memory to receive, okay? In very early days of email, many times you would have remember like a, when you try to send a large message or something large file, uh, the receiver's box might be full. Then you get a message back saying, yeah, couldn't get delivered, okay? Your mailbox is full. Uh, even your, these days, your phone, you may say, oh, my, uh, uh, the, the buffer is full, no new message or can be dropped. So same thing happens here. So first you need to provide a post receive buffer. So then what happens, like in this case, let's say P2 is waiting for two messages, one from P1 and one from P3, it posts these buffers. So then what it does, especially here we're talking about like high performance computing. So those application, we want to operate very quickly as soon as the message comes, okay? So, so in order to do that, there is typical pooling. Of course, you can also trigger interrupt. We'll see that later, but we'll see this example with respect to pooling. Okay. So then this P2 just goes and keeps on polling. It is not doing anything else um, and then polling. 
So then let's say the P3 is ready with the message and it posts the message like it finished its computation, it, it posted the message. Now that adapter, you, you will see that directly will send the message. And since the P2 is polling, it will take that message and putting that into its memory. Okay, so that's how it got received. So you see there is a decoupling. What the sender does and what the receiver does, this action here is totally independent of the send action here. Okay, and then the same thing happens with uh, here on the P1 send a message and then it comes and then P2 receives. So this is a typical two-sided model, uh, typically known as send receives. In the MPI context, you may say MPI send, MPI receive. Um, so like this, any programming model from the top basically will utilize these two. And, and when you design a network through your firmware, through your low-level communication software stack, you need to give this kind of semantics so that the upper-level middleware can be designed. But the, there is a next one, which is one-sided communication model, and that is much more powerful. And let me give you a common example and you can illustrate, you can see this. So this one-sided communication model uh, runs with something like a trust. So imagine like a, in your office, um, you, you have your colleagues, you trust them. Uh, let's say they want to borrow a book from your bookcase. Either they can go through a two-sided model. That means they come knock on your door. If you are an assistant, the assistant takes the thing and gives to them or you tell them, oh, come take this book or you pick up the book and give it to them. But might be, if your friend is very trusted, you say, don't worry. Even if I'm not in my office or I have kept the door my open, I'm working somewhere, you just come and take it, okay? And once you are done, put it back, okay? So that means this one-sided communication model, you can actually establish that kind of a trust first. And once it is done, the sender can actually directly write data to the receiver's memory or grab data from the receiver's memory. Okay, so let's see how that works. So, so in the example, as I said, typically any of the middlewares you write, uh, know there is something called an initialization. Like in MPI world, there is an MPI initialization. Any software stack, you have some basic initialization. So in the initialization step, you can always create these buffers, like a global region creation and exchange some information which are typically known as keys. Okay, we'll see those keys, what that means. Um, and once that is done, then you will see a little bit of difference thing. So see this, if P2 wants to send to P3, I'll reverse back. As soon as you write, these kind of messages have additional knowledge. It is not just that what I'm trying to write, but where to write, okay? So you will see that as the message comes, directly it goes and gets written there. Similarly, you can see like a P1 set the message and then directly it came and then written got to P2. Okay, and what this provides is actually overlap. Okay, so here if you see, as the P2 is coming and trying to write this message, P2 doesn't have to be involved at all in terms of receiving that message. Of course, once the message comes, it, if it knows how the message has come, you can actually then go and look at the message and continue the action. Okay, but there is a good overlap you can achieve. And, and this is like a one-sided communication model. In fact, we'll introduce RDMA is, is like a one-sided communication model, remote DMA that happens at the network. And at the upper layer, similar things like in an MPI context, sometimes people call like a remote memory access or RMA communications. Active message also falls to these with some changes. So, so a lot of these kind of communication models have been developed. And as a network vendor, you come up with this kind of your solution and try to match those things, okay? So we'll keep both these things in mind and now let's see what happens, okay? So, so any of these modern adapters, they have something called a memory registration. Before we do any communication, all memories used for communication must be registered, okay? What does that mean? So typically, you know, like a, these days we write uh, 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 like a, uh, any program runs on the virtual address space, not on the physical address space. But when we talk about uh, network, memory, DMA, all these things are on physical address space. Uh, so that's why in the, our typical operating system class, you would have seen like a virtual memory, we have a page table, we get the things, make an entry on the page table. So all these things are virtual to physical address translation. So same thing happens here. Before I send, if I have a buffer and I want to send the data, 
I actually need to register. Okay, so what it does is it sends that virtual address, it goes through the kernel, and kernel does two things. It actually it maps that virtual address to to a physical address, and what we call here like a pinning. Okay, that is an alternative word gets used, and here definitely we don't allow the process itself to to make this translation because we want to make sure about the security and all those things. But what the Infiniman introduced when it came and some network like Quadrix and all had similar ideas prior to Infiniman. So not only does the address translation, it actually sends a pointer to the SCA or the network adapter that it caches that virtual address and the mapping, okay? And all these things get done. Most of the time it gets done in the beginning at the initialization time. But sometimes you can also do dynamic, like there are, there are solutions, dynamic registration, dynamic pinning. Um, but what it does, it generates two keys. As you can see here, one is a local key and another is a remote key, okay? The local means it will be used by rem local and remote means the remote process has to give it to me. And then what happens, the handle is returned back. So these are all initialization steps happen. Now let's see what happens, actual communication step. So in order to achieve secure communication, Infiniman introduced this and all the other modern networks also do. So when, when let's say at the actual, when I do an MPI send, it will it'll actually send the address. When it presents to the adapter, I also need to present that local key. You remember the local key, which was generated earlier? So to send or receive data, process must provide that local key so that the SCA verifies that 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 uh, that buffer was actually registered or pinned by you, okay? Um, if multiple processes are running, it it prevents that yeah, uh, process A cannot touch process B's memory or C's memory kind of things. So you present this, and this is where you will see the figure. Now it is not going through the kernel, and that is the key. And this is the in the literature it is known as OS communication bypass or kernel bypass. Um, some of the terminologies, and this is a very fast operation because you are not touching the kernel. That's why all these modern networks, the, you remember earlier I said, like a, if you go through the TCP IP stack, it may take you 10 microsecond, 15 microsecond, but using this procedure, I directly go to the adapter and, and I can do this operation in one, one microsecond, okay? And that comes because of this, this bypass operation. So same thing happens for this RDMA, I'm assuming many of you are familiar with the RDMA. That means the DMA has always been there. You know, the DMA is to, it, it got developed in what, 60s and 70s uh, uh, to move data from memory to IO, IO to memory. Of course, you can do always like a, a, a load store, load store operation, but then the CPU will be busy, okay? So DMA was broadly a very early generation assistant, you can think of. Okay, so you can offload the data copies and all to a DMA device. Okay, and RDMA, which stands for remote DMA, extended that to the across the node. That means I can move data from one memory to the other memory. So here it is trying to see that if my memory, somebody else is trying to write to me, in addition to the data, they also need to bring the R key, the present the R key, and then the SC actually knows that I have received the data and the R key is a valid key. And, and these all these R keys and all can get exchanged out of band in the initialization time and, and then the data gets copied like from somebody else, either it can do a put or it can do a get. The only thing we need to make sure that this, uh, keep in mind, this R key is not encrypted in the, in the older InfiniMan, okay? Or in a common InfiniMan. The idea InfiniMan was introduced saying it is a, let's say the, the, your cluster is within a building or within a room, unless you physically get access to the cable or tap that address, you should not be able to manipulate it, okay? But InfiniMan over the years has actually gone through wide area network, okay? You can do InfiniMan protocol communication across different regions, even countries and all. So in those cases, actually they do encryption. And these are actually very expensive router. They do online encryption without any um, uh, performance degradation. Uh, but for most of the common examples, what we'll be seeing, the R key is not encrypted because you don't want to go over that overhead and you also don't want to use any expensive routers. So now all these concepts, 
I think let's try to put together. This is a very nice animation, next three slides. It'll try to bring everything together and you will actually get a feel of how this communication is, is, is happening. So, so here what I'm seeing that there is a sender side on the left, the receiver side is on the right. And first we'll try to see the send receive mode. Okay. So there is a lot of terminologies here saying these are the processor code. There is a QP called Q pair, but there is a completion queue. Um, so just like think of like your assistant, which is a infrequent device, initially as an executive, you need to tell the assistants what to do, okay? So in this example, what we'll see in the, we'll start from the receiver side because the receiver needs to post some information, you know? It's just like a manager, you tell your assistant saying, oh, I'm expecting a call um, from person X, Y, and G. As soon as that call comes, forward it to me, okay? It is exactly the same thing. So it says like a, in the infinite literature, it is known as something called a wiki. It is a receive wiki. It contains information on multiple things. It says, once I get a message from whom I get the message and where to put it in the memory, okay? So it's just like your, your own assistant knows or if the package comes, what to be done, okay? Where to be placed, those kind of things. That is the receiver side. The sender side, the reverse happens, okay? The sender creates an wiki. It contains information about the send buffer. It could be contiguous, it could be non-contiguous. There are some mechanisms like scatter, gather, and all those things. So this is a work you request. And just like you knew in a typical assistance so desk, uh, you see two, two bins. One is outgoing bins, one is incoming bins. That's what we are seeing here. They call it like a Q pair and all. So this is like an outgoing bin. So as soon as the processor does this, the executive or the processor's job is over. So now the, the device is continuously pulling or looking at that bin. It will create, it will take that wiki and then it has all the information. So it will trigger the appropriate DMAs and all to get the information from different memory. It will come together, put the, the packet, have the appropriate tags and headers and all those things and it will send in the network. Over the network, it will go and it will receive the, it will reach the receiver. And now you can think of my example of two-sided communication. It reaches the adapter, but it doesn't know what to do. Okay, because this is a two-sided communication. So now on the receiver side, a matching needs to occur. That receive key which was posted now will be compared because might be the receiver has been, we have posted a lot of keys saying, I want a message from one, five, seven, 10. So it needs to detect where it comes from and then takes that message and then puts it back to the, uh, puts it back into the uh, memory, okay? And, and after putting it in the memory, it will also indicate, <clears throat> give a reference back. It puts an entry to the receiver thing saying, okay, the message has received just like an assistant say, oh, I got this message or I got this check that, that that package got delivered. And the same information, then it sends back to the sender saying that, yeah, things got finished, okay? And, and this entry is something known as completion cookie entry. They call it like a cookie. cookie. So, so the broadly you say, okay, you post two keys, you receive cookies, okay? So that's how a lot of these operations go through. So that is like the, the basic two-sided model. So now if you see, go back to my, that CPU utilization design or the concept, processor is involved only to post receive a key, like the receiver side, post send a key, and then pulling out the completion of cookies. That's what you do. All other times are left for your computation. Okay, so if a network is designed in a proper manner, your CPU utilization for the network protocol processing will be very low here. And that means you are giving most of the cycles for computation. And, and if you design your programs properly, you can actually overlap computation with, with communication. Now let's see how the RDMA based communication using one-sided model differs. Okay, so exactly the same scenario, sender and receiver. So now, the receiver doesn't have to post a wiki. Now the sender, when it creates a wiki, it has not only information about the send buffer, it also has a receive buffer information, okay? And what we are seeing in this animation is like a put or a write operation. You can always also do read in a very similar manner. Now, if you see the next step, that wiki will be read and you get the data from the memory and see the animation, it is different. You see, compared to earlier one, Earlier it used to come and 
reach only on the receiver and then the matching used to happen. But now it is different because it has the exact information on where the data needs to be deposited. So it grabs it, it puts into the, into the memory. Then there are different protocols to detect whether that message has been received, okay? There are some three, four schemes. Um, we, we, we can discuss that later on if you're interested. But once this is done, then you get a hardware hack and then the sender knows that the data has been sent. So effectively compared to the previous scheme, in fact, this is much more better, okay? The in initiator processor is only involved to post send cookie, pull out the completion cookies, and there is no involvement from the target processor, okay? So this is the key. If I can design my programs properly, as the receiver is executing, data can periodically come, data as needed, or data can be sent or a read by somebody else, and then you continue to do the, your, your, your work, okay? And that gives you the maximum overlap of computation and communication. That gives you good performance, uh, speed up, scalability. And this is what a lot of these communication middleware designers have been over the years, including our group, many other groups have been working on these kind of uh, solutions. So then let me introduce the same ideas in the, in a memory semantics or called atomics. And uh, very similar idea. Uh, earlier I said only send receives. Um, some of you might be knowing about atomics. Uh, these are like, you know, fetch and add, compare and swap. These are used for operating system. Like I want to do a distributed locks. I want to do some barrier synchronization. Earlier, those mechanisms were not available over the network. Uh, there were solutions within the shared memory. I can do a good lock design. I can do a, a barrier semaphore, but across network, it was not possible. And InfiniMan introduced for the very first time. And in fact, that is the very first introduction of adapters trying to do computation, okay? Until that time, the adapters were only like a passive. That means they're just moving data in and out. They were not performing computation, okay? So let's see what that means. So here you will see, a simple example called a fetch and add, okay? That means there is a target, I have some data, and let's say 10, sender has data five, I want to combine this, okay? So that means I send the data to a receiver, receiver actually has to fetch 10, add for five, and put it back 15 in its own memory and send me also that 15. And we want to do it in an atomic manner so that in between, that, that uh, target adapter doesn't handle anything else, okay? It doesn't break it because let's say somebody else is trying to do a fetch and add with the data three, it doesn't become like 10 plus three, 13, okay? If that gets done, then this, this five will happen later on. So it will get added later on, it will become 18, okay? So, so this is the kind of things we want to do it in atomic manner. So, so in the beginning, it started with like a 64 bit segment and, and you see the data comes here. It goes and fetches the data from the memory. It actually now performs the computation, okay? And then sends the data back to the sender and then puts the data back to the receiver. So this was the very early stage of adapter doing computation. Um, but over the years, uh, now if you see, not only InfiniMan, a lot of adapters have started like all these smart NICs. That means the NIC is able to <clears throat> have like a programmable processor or even a PGAs, People are coming up with different, different solutions. And we'll take a look at a little bit of the NVIDIA smart NICs later uh, in this tutorial, and we'll see how that is working. Um, and even a lot of computations these days are even moving to the network itself, switches. Uh, you can do all reduce, these are like in-network computing. So, so they were broadly in these kind of designs, at least here, if you see, the initiator processor is involved only to post and okay, pulling out the completed cookie and there is no involvement from the target processor, okay? And all these are geared towards that kind of a overlap I talked about, like a overlap of computation with communication, overlap of computation with, with, uh, uh, with um, uh, fetch and add or synchronization kind of operation, okay? Um, so we'll finish this segment here, um, just to understand how the communication and all works. And then I, We'll go into more details. Uh, Hari will take over from here. Uh, but if there are any quick questions, I'll be happy to answer. Excuse me. 
um do we want to take a short break now or uh, like a little later uh, i think let's continue okay. let's continue what yeah. i'll do is i'll log out i'll fix up my zoom and then get in okay okay sure yeah so sure. you can uh, so i'll log out for the um, for a short time and then come come back okay sure yeah. sounds good thank you so uh, if there are no, no further questions uh, uh, let us proceed so so far we have looked at uh, the history and the evolution of high performance networks some of the basic communication model and semantics of high performance networks so um just give me one second here yeah you you take over the the yes. remote control yeah it is still yeah uh, i am trying to see how i can uh, stop the remote control uh, um let let me log out that will be more simpler <laughs> it will control goes back to you okay, no no i got it I got okay it. okay got it okay so um the basic communication model and semantics that we looked at previously is applicable to almost every high performance communication network out there <clears throat> even though we took the example of infiniband similar concepts of registration um uh, sending receiving bookies cookies uh, do exist for everything else the names may differ but the concepts are still very similar uh, so with that kind of a, a prelude uh, let's get into uh, more details of infiniband and high speed ethernet so we'll talk about the evolution the architecture and basic concepts some features and some bridge protocols so if you compare uh, infiniband with the traditional uh, uh, iso osi uh, networking stack uh, there is a lot of similarity so you have your traditional physical layer uh, for ethernet which is copper optical or wireless or in the infiniband side it's just copper or optical now between the link layer and the physical layer you have the uh, network management entity called uh, subnet manager uh, the popular open source version of a subnet manager is called opensm uh, and the job of the OpenSM is to make sure that the network is up and running. Um, so yes, uh, uh, Constantinos, uh, the slides uh, will be available. I, um, yeah, so uh, I have posted the link to the slides uh, here uh, on chat. Um, and the slides will be made available uh, to you guys as well. Um, so continuing on. So the job of subnet manager is to make sure that it brings up the network, everything is up and running, all the uh, routes are clear, all the switches are populated, there are no deadlocks and all that good stuff. So then you have the network layer, which uh, performs the routing. In most cases, uh, because of the uh, size of the deployments, uh, typical high performance systems uh, don't have uh, don't have the necessity for uh, routing because um, most uh, deployments fit in one um, let's say a server room so mostly it is a switched network so on top of that uh, you have uh, the transport layer this is where the main differences uh, uh, begin to appear the transport layer for the ethernet side is what is called as tcp ip uh, or udp uh, uh, connection oriented and reliable connection less and unreliable Similarly, you have RC, which is reliable connected, and UD, which is unreliable data graph, which are, um, let's say, in a very simplistic way, corollaries of uh, TCP IP and UDP on the uh, Ethernet side. Between the transport layer and the application layer, if you look at uh, the Ethernet side, you have the sockets interface. On the InfiniBand side, you have what is called as the Open Fabrics Verbs interface. Uh, now, this is one of the biggest differences and one of the major causes for the uh, improvements that InfiniBand is able to deliver in terms of performance. Now, if you look at the sockets interface the, for the traditional Ethernet, there is a context switch that happens from user space to kernel space. With open fabrics verbs, the context switch does not uh, exist. Once you, you, you would go through the kernel initially to set up uh, the various resources, uh, register the memory, so on and so forth. And uh, during your critical communication phases, you would bypass the kernel and go directly to the hardware. So that is made possible through the newer Open Fabrics Verbs interface. And as we go along, we will see how uh, various vendors and others try to modify and enhance the socket interface and how these two are kind of coming together. Okay. So with this background, uh, this is how uh, your uh, stacks look like initially. You have the sockets-based interface uh, serving applications and middleware, and that can go over TCP IP. Now, when InfiniBand came out, Ethernet was the dominant network, so you had to play well with Ethernet. So what InfiniBand did was to create a bridge protocol called IP over InfiniBand or IP over IB. 
uh, which would encapsulate uh, InfiniBand, uh, let's say, uh, IP packets into an InfiniBand frame. So by doing this, your traditional sockets-based applications could use the higher performance InfiniBand adapters and InfiniBand switches. So this was the first kind of bridge protocol that came, uh, came up. But as you see, there is still a context which happens from the user space into the kernel space. So your performance would still uh, not be as good as you would get with the verbs interface where, where there is no context switch that happens in the critical communication path from the user space all the way to the kernel space. So this is how your communication protocol stands or stood. Let's say if you rewind the clock 20 years, okay? Now, we will keep populating these slides with uh, um, newer developments as we move along the presentation. And at the end, if you take a look at this one slide, it will tell you, okay, where, was, uh, where were the networks 20 years ago? Where is it now? What is the uh, software looking like? What is the hardware looking like? What are the various connectivities between the software and the hardware? So this would be a kind of your cheat sheet, so to speak. <laughs> So let's see how InfiniBand has evolved over the last uh, couple of decades. So we started again from SDR with a single data rate and uh, because of scales, we are not able to show that in the graph here. Currently, we are at NDR, uh, uh, which uh, stands for next data rate. And um, it is at about 400 uh, gigabits uh, per second, uh, 4X uh, NDR. The next generation uh, is supposed to go to 800 and very soon we should cross the terabit uh, boundary. So the general uh, idea is that in the next uh, five to eight years, you will probably hit uh, the terabit boundary uh, for the InfiniBand side. Uh, the most recent release of the InfiniBand standard was 1.6, uh, which introduced support for large radix switches. So if you look at uh, uh, current generation InfiniBand uh, deployments, you will have either a 36 or a 48 uh, port switch. Uh, and uh, there is nothing really bad about that. The only thing is that if you want to create larger deployments, you will have to create more number of, uh, you will have to use more number of switches and cables, which will add to the cost. So for an example, this table shows the number of cable switches uh, required to, cre uh, to create, uh, let's say a large deployment, let's say a 256 uh, uh, node deployment uh, with a 64 port switch. Uh, as uh, and uh, with a 256 port switch. So as you can see, the number of uh, cables, switches, and uh, the overall network hops will be significantly lower with a larger Radix switch. The other major changes uh, which was introduced in the uh, recent uh, volume was that there were two new opcodes uh, for generalized transport functions, an extended opcode for extended transport header, and uh, they are also trying to uh, increase the speeds, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with the next generation. So uh, this is how the InfiniBand standard has been evolving. Now let's take a look at the architecture and some of the basic hardware components. So there are multiple players in the InfiniBand, uh, uh, let's say, uh, network. One is what is called as a channel adapter or CA. Depending on whether they are on a compute node or an IO node, you would call them as a host channel adapter or a target channel adapter. Now, in most cases, uh, the term that you will be familiar with is what is called as a host channel adapter. So a host channel adapter will have uh, a number of physical ports, some virtual lanes associated with each physical port for quality of service. Uh, you will have some DMA engines, uh, which are servicing a bunch of network endpoints called Q pairs, as we discussed earlier. So at a high level, this is how the uh, network endpoint looks like. Uh, the network devices are, of course, the switches and routers. The switches are for intra-subnet communication, and the routers uh, sit at the boundaries of multiple subnets to form inter-subnet communication. As I mentioned earlier, most state-of-the-art InfiniBand deployments uh, fit within one subnet, you typically don't have to go across uh, subnets. And uh, there are also cables, which forms the third component of the uh, network fabric, the cables, links, and uh, repeaters. So most of InfiniBand cabling is still uh, like, uh, was still uh, copper, but slowly there is a movement towards uh, uh, optical cables. And several years ago, Intel had come up with uh, uh, an excellent, um, uh, let's say, 100 meter length optical cable, which could convert uh, copper to optics 
with about 550 picoseconds latency. So, um, and I don't think it is being used actively right now, but this was, uh, uh, let's say, state of the art and something which is very good, uh, which is introduced probably 17 years or 18 years ago. Now let's take a brief look at uh, some of the novel hardware features that InfiniBand offers. And again, um, as we mentioned earlier, the InfiniBand uh, specification is about 1700 pages long. We just do not have the time to go over all of that. So we are picking and choosing and giving you a flavor at maybe like a 50,000 foot level of uh, these uh, various uh, uh, capabilities and features. And as I mentioned earlier, most of these features uh, in principle are applicable to other networks as well. So we are just going into it in more detail for one sample network. Uh, please note that similar features do exist for other networks too. So we look at the basic uh, communication model and uh, semantics. So we'll uh, start with the transport layer. So the transport layer, uh, the network endpoints in InfiniBand are called queue pairs, which stands for a pair of uh, uh, like send and receive queues. The application would post what is called as work queue elements or Wookiees uh, into the send and receive queues. These Wookiees would be processed in some order by the InfiniBand device. And once the Wookiees are processed, they would be placed into the completion queue as completion queue elements or cookies. Now note that these Wookiees and cookies are just data structures containing metadata to the location in memory and the appropriate uh, keys to access that memory, uh, which the network device can use to perform the data transfer. So they don't contain the actual data element itself. So they would be like fairly small control structures. So let's uh, take a look uh, at the network and link layers and some of the salient capabilities of these layers. So we'll touch upon buffering and flow control, virtual lanes, service levels, and how you implement a differentiated quality of service using them, switching, and multicast. So if you look at uh, um, most InfiniBand devices as per the spec, you would have 16 different virtual lanes, 0 through 15. Zero is for uh, the zero is the default data virtual lane, and fifteen is the default management uh, virtual lane. So if you don't do anything, data traffic will always go through virtual lane zero, and management traffic will always go through virtual lane fifteen. And there will be uh, certain hardware uh, devices uh, in the uh, network adapter to. Uh, go over these virtual lanes, select the appropriate packets, and send it over the network. Now let's take a brief look at how you can implement a differentiated quality of service using virtual lanes and service levels. Now virtual lanes are a hardware concept. So if you create more virtual lanes, the buffering capabilities at the network devices like the switches, the routers, and the uh, channel adapters have to be split up between these virtual lanes, ensuring that there is no head of line blocking, which means that if you have a very large flow going, a smaller flow is not going to be bottlenecked by that because you have separate available resources as long as you, they, they are using different paths. Now, how do you tell uh, the traffic that they have to use different paths? This is done by using service levels. So the network administrator is going to create a policy saying that, hey, end user, if you use this particular service level, then your traffic will be routed through this particular virtual lane. And this information is given to the end user. There are two tables in the network, uh, InfiniBand network. One is called the service level to virtual lane table, which, ma which maps the service level to the virtual lane, and a virtual lane arbitration table, which decides how much data to select from each virtual lane for transmission. So by using these two concepts, one can create high priority virtual lanes, and then high priority service level to map onto those virtual lanes, which the application can use to tag their packets. So this is how one implements a differentiated quality of service using service levels and virtual lanes. The next concept uh, is uh, your basic routing as well as uh, multicast. So just like on the Ethernet side, your uh, switching happens with uh, what is called as MAC addresses. On the InfiniBand side, switching happens with what is called as local identifiers, LIDs. These are unique identifiers in, in a subnet, which is assigned to each network device, network endpoint by the subnet manager, which is the manager for the entire InfiniBand network. So once uh, the LIDs have been uh, assigned, the, uh, the switching tables will be populated by the OpenSM. 
And similarly, for multicast packets, what would happen is that you would create a multicast group table. While a unicast table says that a packet belonging to a, a packet having this destination identifier should go through this egress port, a multicast packet uh, would have a multicast group ID saying that a packet with this particular multicast group ID needs to be replicated through uh, ports A, B, and C. Okay. And there are standard multicast uh, group management protocols with create, join, leave, prone, etc. So all the multicast features happen inside a switch. And the switch is the basic uh, uh, unit for in, uh, in, in IB networking. And the basic unit of switching is a crossbar. So if you take a look at a standard pizza box switch, uh, and depending on the generation, it would have different ports starting from 24, 36, 48, so on and so forth. All of them are crossbars, which means that there is an individual path from every port to every other port. To put it in a simplistic way, think of having a road from every home to every other home. So there would never be any congestion. But if you think of the number of roads you have to create, it would be very, 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 very large and practically not possible. So in most cases, larger deployments are created by a hierarchy of crossbars to create non-blocking switches. It could be in multiple topologies. It could be a full factory, a partial factory, a Taurus, um, a dragonfly, a slim fly, whatever. But for a non-blocking switch, the only guarantee that we have is that for any random node pair selection, there exists a configuration such, as, such that the communication is non-blocking. However, if the node pair changes, there could be a uh, congestion that happens in the network. Now let's take a look at how one can uh, do basic switching in InfiniBand and some techniques that the IB standard provides you to avoid congestion. Now, as I mentioned, the local identifier or LID is the uh, basic uh, addressing mechanism for switching in IB. Suppose P1 wants to send a message to P2. So what would happen is that P1 will have to populate the packet with P2's LID, and that LID will be used for switching decisions in the network. Let's assume that P2 has an LID of two. So assuming that the network has already been set up correctly, each switch will forward the packet to the appropriate um, peer switch to make sure that the packet reaches the target. So in this particular case, the forwarding table says, if you want to reach the destination LID two, you have to take an egress port of one. So it goes to this spine switch and from there comes down to the leaf switch and to your destination port. Now let's say for some reason, if this path is congested or if this switch goes down, I'm stuck. So this is where assigning multiple LIDs to a, port, to a destination port helps. And why is this so? This is because InfiniBand till very recently was statically routed, which means that OpenSM finds out what is the path from one node to every other node in the network when you create the network statically. And that remains in play for the remainder of the duration, unless there is a drastic network event, like something going down that happens. So in this case, if you had multiple LIDs, then the OpenSM would have initially configured alternate paths through the network so that, let's say, I could potentially use a destination LID of four and then have the packet go through a different path in the uh, network and reach my target. This is a way to avoid congestion as well as to introduce redundancy in communication. And uh, different uh, routing algorithms may give different paths. Now let's take a look at the basic example of a multicast and how it happens. Now, depending on the size of your fabric, your subnet manager, which is the entity responsible for managing your network, may reside on an end compute node or a switch. In general, for very large networks, let's say for a, a network of thousands of nodes, we have seen that the subnet manager is hosted on an end compute node because of the uh, vast, the large computing capabilities required to create deadlock-free uh, routing, okay? So let's assume that the subnet manager is on a compute node. 
So once the subtenant manager comes up uh, and it has, has uh, set up all the networks, what would happen is that any compute node who wants to join or create a multicast group will send a message to the subtenant manager saying that, hey, I'm here. I want to create this multicast group or join this multicast group. When the subnet manager receives that message, the join message, it is going to populate all the switches in the path with the appropriate multicast group IDs and the egress ports. Now, let's say later in a point in time, if a different compute node wants to join the same uh, multicast group, it would send a message to subnet manager. The subnet manager will make appropriate changes to the network. And as you see, now, if uh, a multicast message comes to this particular switch with this particular group ID, it is going to get replicated through these two ports. Okay. So at a high level, this is how basic switching and routing and multicast mechanisms work in InfiniBand. Now we looked at uh, the link layer and the network layer. Let's look at the transport layer now and see how the transport interface looks like. Okay. So IP has a variety of different transport mechanisms starting from reliable connection which is like TCP IP to unreliable datagram which is like UD. Each one of these transport protocols have different characteristics in terms of uh, scalability that is cost and features which is performance. Reliable connection has uh, because it's connection oriented requires a lot of endpoints to create all to all connectivity. However, it is very, very, very feature rich. Unreliable datagram on the other hand is very scalable because it is connection less. However, it does not have any of the nice features like atomics or RDMA that RC has. So vendors try to come up with a lot of bridge protocols like extendable, extended reliable connection and dynamic connected to see if you can get the scalability of un unreliable connection, connection datagram with the performance and features of reliable connection. So this is where the state of the art lies in terms of transport protocols. If you look at IB, um, any questions uh, so far? Okay, if not, um, we can move on. So as I mentioned earlier, I introduced a slide where you had um, ethernet and sockets on the left-hand side and verbs on the right-hand side. Now, slowly, we are going to introduce a lot of bridge protocols, which show you how to bridge that gap. Okay, and the first such bridge protocol that came up with was what is called as SDP or Sockets Direct Protocol. Now, as I mentioned with IP over IB, the biggest benefit was that sockets based applications could now go over high performance InfiniBand networks and channel adapters. Okay, so getting a bump up from one gig to maybe 10 gigs. However, you still go through the kernel for most of the communication, which is bad for latency and bandwidth. So when SD, and again, I'm talking uh, uh, this in the context of, let's say, 15 to 20 years ago, okay? Not in the current context, because things have evolved since then. Now, when SDP was introduced, the goal was that the control traffic would still go through the sockets API through the kernel with appropriate handshakes but the data transfers would bypass the kernel and go directly to the channel adapter. So by doing this, we were able to get good bandwidth, but the latency was still not that great. Now, later, maybe eight, uh, eight to 10 years ago, there was a new protocol that was brought out, which is called RSockets. So RSockets intercepts basic sockets calls and tries to redirect them through the RSockets library over RDMA CM or verbs as appropriate. So by doing this, we were able to bypass the um, user space to kernel space context switch and get good latency and good bandwidth. But the problem was that because we were still restricted by the sockets interface, one is not able to perform RDMA operations using that. So you still are restricted to your send receive model. Now with these two, your overall communication picture looks something like this. So remember, we started with TCP IP on the left extreme and verbs on the right extreme. Now you see that you have two bridge protocols here, and this is how they look, look like. So SDP uses verbs directly and goes over uh, IB adapter and switches. R sockets still is uh, used, uh, 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 let's say, uh, on this side, and it gives you a better performance and uh, bandwidth. 
Uh, with this, um, if there are no further questions, let me hand over to Dr. Panda uh, to discuss uh, the high-speed uh, Ethernet family. So let me share, um, Hari, and then... Um... Um, so Sorry. just a quick question on mechanics, Dr. Panda. So um, do you want to give a break uh, after the uh, high-speed Ethernet section or shall we? Yes, I think let's finish that uh, high-speed Ethernet section. Um, then yeah. we'll, we'll go through a, oh, actually we are at 5.40. If we want to take a five minutes break now, that will be a good time. Okay. So let's take a five minutes break, um, uh, 5.45 Eastern uh, or uh, 2.45 2 Pacific, we'll join back. Okay. okay sure. Very, very short break yeah. yeah sure thanks so dr panda um mm -hmm. i will take back uh at uh, um Omnipath architecture yeah so omnipath you'll take uh yeah. omnipath uh, and, and uh, i will go all the way to uh the, the dpus and do you want to talk about the dpus I'll I'll go over the DPUs. Okay, yeah. sure. Sounds we'll good. Finish the slingshot and then I'll take over the DPUs and then continue. Okay, sure. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks.
Okay, so I am hoping people are back. Should we get started? Okay. So so you saw like we started with uh, like the the infinite as a as the first network and then trying to understand all the different kinds of features uh, and uh, uh, how the network is designed. So before we move to the other networks, let's take a look what has happened also on the Ethernet side. So Ethernet side, we'll start with this first kind of a standard, which is called iWarp. I don't know how many of you have heard of iWarp. Anyone? No? Okay. So this stands for, as you know, this Internet Wide Area RDMA Protocol. So when Infinement came, of course, the RDMA was the totally the new thing. Uh, that's what led to all these OS bypass protocols and everything it gave to really one-sided protocols, gave good performance. So the Ethernet Consortium trying to ask questions saying, can we take, I mean, RDMA is a mechanism. In the beginning, people thought that oh, RDMA is a part of Infinement, but RDMA is a mechanism, okay? If you can take that mechanism to Ethernet, you can also have RDMA over Ethernet. So that's how this, this internet wider area RDMA protocol started. We'll, we'll start with that, take a look at the architecture and components, and especially focus on two features and how it compares and contrasts with infinite out of order data placement, dynamic and fine guest data rate control. And then we'll also see over the years, like uh, there have been different vendor specific stacks. So these are not open, but these are more some of the proprietary, but again, they get used also in, in many different uh, places. So overall, if you take a look at these RDMA models of the 1040 gigabit and Infiniment here, we have just listed some features. Uh, many of them are supported, okay? But there are some differences here in terms of data placement, data rate control, QoS and multipathing, and we'll take a look at quickly um, some of these. So out of the companies, when when actually this was the, uh, I think the late uh, uh, 2000, there is a very big competition between Infiniman and, and IWAR. And that time there were multiple IWAR vendors. Uh, Chelsea, I don't know if some of you have heard of, they are still active. They have actually a truly IWAR architecture. In fact, it is very widely used in a lot of storage systems. Those who want to remain purely ethernet site and with RDMA features, Chelsea is the company, uh, they have the products. There was another company called NetEffect and they also competing with Chelsea at that time, but then they were acquired by Intel and then that product actually has died. Uh, they have come in all different forms and shapes uh, later on with Omnipath or Intel's own adapter and all, but as of now, there is only one vendor which has the solution which is called iWARP. So, so then in the standard, what does the iWARP mean? So if you see a look at this TCP or SCTP stack, we have TCP IP. But if an application, if I want to do an RDMA, that consortium debated a lot and introduced these three additional modules. Okay. So one is called RDMA protocol, RDMAP, remote direct data placement, because that is the most important component. Uh, how do you do data placement, data delivery, multi-stream semantics, connection management, that was RDDP. And then in order to achieve that RDMA kind of principles, they had to come with another module, which is called marker PDU aligned or MPA. Okay. So let's take a look at how they solve this, like a RDMA was a mechanism and how they brought into the ethernet world so that it can remain uh, operable on top of the, Ethernet. So the so the first issues come RDM. If you if you remember the some of the slides, let's say I I want to do a one-sided operation. I have a header. I give the data might be a two gigabytes of data, and then it exactly goes and finishes, and then I get the acknowledge back. But then what happens in the Ethernet world? As you know, Ethernet is very uh, 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 pervasive. A lot of uh, products are out there, different adapter, different switches. So you cannot guarantee that all the switches, all the adapters follow the same protocols, okay? So, so let's say I have a big data. If the place the data as it arrives, whether in or out of order, okay? So most of the time, Infiniment, because it's a proprietary, I mean, not proprietary, like a standard designed with only few vendors, the specification says that, yeah, data gets delivered in order, okay? Um, it tries to maintain that from the adapter, the cable, the switches and all. Uh, 
But in the Ethernet world, if I send a one gigabyte of data from this side, I cannot guarantee that the data is reaching in the receiver side in order. If it receives out of order, then the question is, how do I determine where to put it? Okay, because if I don't put it, then the data corruption will happen and then the entire stack will get, um, will not be functioning properly. So that has issues both from the application's perspective as well as protocol stack's perspective. So that means application perspective, if the second half of the message has been placed, does not mean that the first half of the message has arrived. Okay, and if one message has been placed, it doesn't mean that the previous messages have been placed. And same thing happens also from the protocol stacks perspective. The receiver network stack has to understand each and every frame of the data and all. So to solve the problem, this is that MPA protocol layer they added. So if I go back here, if you see this is the MPA module. So what this MPA does, as you can see the name called marker PDU align. So the idea is that before you send a message buffer, that, that message actually gets processed. And what that PDU align says, like if I have a big message, from the beginning of the, of the header, it actually puts some markers at, at an appropriate places, okay? So, and typically Ethernet, as you know, like is a, uh, like a standard is package size is like 1024 or one kilobyte. And they added these this, uh, different uh, markers at 512 bytes interval, okay? So what that means that whenever you receive a receive uh, a packet, at least you will get one marker. Okay. So so let's say I send a message, long message with uh, ten packets on this side, but on the receiver side the packet ninth came first. So from that marker it can quickly find out oh this is my ninth. So in the receiver buffer it will actually put it in the ninth offset, not in the beginning. So like this, as the messages are coming it will appropriately put and when the, all the messages come it tries to give you back. So that's why. That's how they were able to achieve this kind of the RDMA over uh, Ethernet. And that's how the uh, iWork came, but it has some overhead. And that's what we'll see, like if you take some performance numbers, because it goes through these additional layers, it actually adds some, some overhead. The other two features, which separates out the InfiniMan and, and this Ethernet slash RDMA are like a dynamic and fine grained rate control. Okay, so this is actually a part of the Ethernet standard, not iWork. Uh, for example, uh, you know, those of you might be familiar with the Ethernet. So let's say I have a 10 gigabits uh, network. Um, I want to use it as like a five gigabits. I want to slow it down. I can put one stall for every packet. Okay. So that gradually it reduces and becomes five gigabits. Of course, there is a TCP windowing behavior may change a little bit of that. And these are controlled through source. So in fact, in the Ethernet world, there are a lot of networks situations are there which are high latency, high bandwidth. Can somebody tell me like where these are used? Okay. We are not talking about low latency, high bandwidth, which we have been focusing so far. This is high latency, high bandwidth. Okay. So these actually get used in the transcontinental links. Okay, so when we are sending data, let's say from US to Europe, Europe to Asia, Singapore, these are high bandwidth networks. Okay, now if I go through a protocol, like let's say I, I send the yeah, underwater links, uh, Christine, thanks. So if I keep on sending messages and something happens at the receiver and something gets dropped, by the time I receive the response back, there are so many packets in, 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 the, in the pipe, I have to actually drop all those things and the utilization is very poor. So, so this is where like the larger window is exposed on the receiver side, receiver overflow is controlled through rate control from the sender side. So you typically find out what is the current rate and dynamically changes, what is the health of the network and based on that you control. So those kind of things you can actually do it um, uh, with, with, with this ethernet kind of things easily. We also talked about uh, QoS uh, and, and, and QoS actually here also what happens <clears throat> it has like both networks are similar, like InfiniMan, uh, Hari introduced the service levels and all. Um, here also Ethernet, it has eight classes. You can have two priority, high priority, low priority. But exact bandwidth request in the InfiniMan, if you remember, we, we discussed like a SDR, DDR, QDR. So you can always downgrade your speed, but to the lowest band, okay? So that means let's say I have FDR, I can move down to QDR. 
or to DDR. But I cannot specifically say, okay, give me 7.28 gigabits per second. You cannot do. It operates within the band. But on the Ethernet, complete flexibility is there. And I know, uh, or sorry, I mean, some of you might be knowing there is a protocol called RSVP. Uh, RSVP, it's just like, you know, you get an e, e, e invite, e invite and say, oh, I'm having a, this birthday party, please do RSVP, okay? The same idea here once happens. That means before I send the message, there is a probe which goes through all the adapter switches and see how much bandwidth is there, remaining bandwidth, okay? And then if the if the sender has requested, okay, I want to send only 3.62 gigabits per second on the entire path, it actually goes and subtracts and then confirms you saying, yeah, this is good. And these kind of things are actually used in, in terms of uh, multimedia traffic. Uh, when you are trying to, you know, the established connections, like we, you are downloading Netflix, you are downloading a lot of uh, uh, the stream. Uh, there you need this kind of a constant bandwidth and you can adjust that. So, so, so these are some of the major differences between um, iWarp and InfiniBan. Now in that big, big, uh, uh, picture, the the iWarp actually sits here. You see, um, we got introduced the R sockets and all these were on the left hand side. HDP was on the right hand side, but here the iWarp actually instead of RDMA, it was using TCP/IP with enhancement to RDMA. This is also a user space protocol. Instead of Infinite adapter, it was an iWarp adapter, and instead of Infinite switch, it uses the Ethernet switch. So. So the same program that is most interesting, we'll introduce this software stack a little bit later. These are called verbs. And in fact, in the very beginning, there was a consortium called Open InfiniBand, Open IB. Once the iWork came into the picture, it got redefined as Open Fabrics. Okay. In fact, there's an Open Fabrics event. Some of you must be familiar. It happens in the March. Um, so this is where like a, all of these things have been unified. So that means if I have any upper level software, which has been written with verbs, it could be an MPI module or it could be um, any of the like a file system and all, it can actually run on InfiniBand and iWarp in a, in a transparent manner, okay? There is a question here or discussion on the chat. I'm seeing David. Um, um, it, it is more of a discussion, Dr. Pandey. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, David, sharing this, okay? So, so now you're seeing this gradually our chat is filling up. So let's move to the next one and then um we'll we'll see uh, so then in this ethernet world there is also a lot of vendor specific stacks and especially we'll take two two of these um one is by miricom you remember i introduced this miricom as saying first cluster network that they had but then over the years actually they introduced something new which was like a you know we talked about tcp ip and how you can accelerate using os bypass protocols and all they took those same ideas and enhanced the UDP protocols. Now you can always ask saying, okay, why, why somebody is speeding up UDP protocol? Because most of the time we use the TCP IP because these are reliable and uh, packets don't get dropped and all. But the primary motivation here is financial market. Okay, so their requirements are very different than our HPC and AI and all those things, the stock market, if you remember, I mean, I'm sure some of you invest on stocks and all. Um, you are looking at the 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 stock prices or the uh, the symbols or the sorry the tickers. Okay, as the market is fluctuating, it it is like a it doesn't have to be exactly like when the ticket changed. I need to receive exactly at the same time. Even if I get a little bit two minutes delay, it's okay. If a packet gets dropped in between, that's fine. I'll catch up. Okay, same thing happens with the game scores. Uh, uh, people are betting, all those kind of things. So this is, is timeliness is more important than reliability. Okay, so so that's why it's is the UDP protocol they wanted to enhance because UDP protocol was taking more time, but they wanted to make it much more faster so that all these financial transactions and all can take place. And and these this stack still gets used in the stock market, but of course is covered by NDA. They don't go into uh, much more details. There is another stack which was introduced. This is a company also has died, uh, been acquired. Uh, this is called Solar Flare. I don't know if some of you, but it's a UK based company, it started. So, so here the idea, we talked about a lot of this like a voice bypass. Uh, so what they actually provided 
a kind of a solution protocol processing, it can happen in a hybrid manner. Kernel can do something, user space can do something. It is not either or. And through that, the protocol state is shared between application and kernel using shared memory. And through that, they were able to deliver very good performance on a range of applications. Uh, and again, this is, you, you can refer to some of these pointers I've indicated, uh, but this is also a proprietary uh, stack kind of things. But recently what has happened, because there is a lot of demand in the ethernet world, there is a newer direction, intermediate direction is coming, which is called like a two of these, we'll see this is the convergence technology. One is called a virtual protocol interconnect or VPI. And more common these days, which are being used called RDMA over converse enhanced ethernet or called Rocky. Okay, so let's take a look at that, these two protocols and what it means. So the VPI was actually, the, both of these introduced by Mellanox slash NVIDIA. When the Mellanox was the Infiniman uh, vendor in the beginning, uh, you remember when I said FDR, there were two ports you can combine. So two ports you can always combine as a channel bonding, but in the beginning they also introduced and now also it is available. Like you can have two ports, you can configure these two ports. One can be a native infinite, like it goes through words, transport, network and link. The other one actually can support TCP IP, standard TCP IP, nothing to do with IWARP and all. So they were competing with Chelsea, they are still competing with Chelsea. Okay, so where do you use this? So there could be situations, let's say you have a data center, Infiniman you want to do within the cluster and Ethernet outside. Okay. Or you can do in terms of network management, you can do within the cluster, you can do network, Infiniman network management and outside you can do Ethernet management. In those kind of things, if every server you connect these adapters and one, all these Infiniman are connect, ports are connected to an Infiniman switch, Ethernet ports are connected to Ethernet switch, you can have these different kinds of functionalities. So that's what they introduced earlier. But in the recent years, what they have introduced, something called Rocky. I, I'm assuming here many of you must have heard of this. Um, uh, if you have not heard, this is how the Rocky protocol stands. This is not a not yet an IEEE standard yet. Okay, there have been a lot of discussion, but this is primarily Mellanox slash NVIDIA has been pushing. So the idea is that in the infinite world, I mean, of course, the adapter gives good performance because of all these RDMA voice bypass protocol, but Many organizations, especially like if you want to go to like a, uh, insurance companies uh, or uh, those who are very traditional, they don't want to change it over the night, okay? Or some of the banks and all. So they have a huge investment they have done with the Ethernet switches and all, but they want also get performance. So this is where it comes like in a very short manner, in a very concise manner. You can think of it as like a Ethernet hardware with Infiniment software. You can think like that. Okay, so that's how they introduced. So if you see the Infiniman, they, this was Rocky V1. So what they did is like a verse transport, but when it comes at the lowest layer, it gets translated to ethernet. Okay, on the center side and the receiver side, it gets reversed. And it is not just the adapter. There's the same physical adapter. They actually had two different formats or slight changes. So they can sell you as either Infiniman uh, adapter or ethernet adapter. And then what they try to do is the same thing that uh, the, the switches also. If you, if you think of the switch, I mean, so Infiniment switch kept on moving ahead. We saw all these speeds. In fact, they compete with Ethernet. If the Ethernet 100 gig switch is not there, where Infiniment 100 gig is already there, they can sell that also at Ethernet. Because internally, they, they modify the protocol on the receiver port and the sender port. Everything else remains the same. Okay. So, so that's how they're able to now from the Mellanox, NVIDIA, or any of these vendors, you can actually get the multiple adapters, okay? It could be your Rocky V1, and then gradually they move to Rocky V2. So the Rocky V2 is more like they, they introduced, in fact, here if you see the UDP IP at the network layer, so that you can actually provide uh, ACLs like emitting, accounting, firewalling, GMP snooping, all those kind of things. So, so you can actually buy the Rocky adapter from them. Now, actually over the last few years, Broadcom is going very strong on this. So the Broadcom is actually trying to enter the um, uh, HPC market. Uh, traditionally, they had the basic adapter, Ethernet adapter, which is TCP IP, but now they have moved to Rocky. Um, so if you look at their Thor adapter, there you will see like they, they can deliver very good performance. Uh, it, it comes very closer to Infiniman. We'll have some 
numbers later on. Uh, so they are able to, they are entering that market. Um, in between some time also other vendors like a um, Oracle had come, uh, they were also trying to do. So as of now, you will see like a, now if I go to the, the next slide, this is where the Rocky comes, okay? So if you see, they are very similar. RDMA, RDMA user interface, instead of infrared adapter, Rocky adapter, and instead of switch, infrared switch, you get ethernet switch, okay? So, so that gives actually, we have one more enhanced of these slides, but this slide continues completely gives you like a cheat sheet as, as, as uh, Hari indicated. It will exactly tell if you hear any of these terminologies, if you are talking to vendors, system integrators, what protocols, this, this slide 81 and its enhanced version later on will give you a complete, complete picture here. Any additional questions? So if not, let me hand it over to Hari. Um, we have several other architectures. We'll take a look. He will talk about the Omnipath. Uh, NVIDIA's, NVLink and all, Amazon EFA and Slingshot, and then I'll come into the SmartNIC, okay? I believe Sorry, we can, can see my uh, slides. Yeah, yes, yes, we can see. So uh, we'll talk about the Omnipath interconnect architecture next. So I'll provide a brief history of Omnipath. Uh, and again, as I mentioned with InfiniBand, uh, uh, no dis disrespect to any vendors out there. All of these are great technologies but we only have so much time and uh, we are trying to cover uh, like a, a whole standard and a whole product in like five slides. So we are doing uh, the best to, 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 to do justice to that product. So where, what is Omnipath? Where was it? Where is it heading? So back in 2003, uh, there was a company called Pathscale, which came up with an initial version of an InfiniBand based product. QLogic later uh, brought, bought that uh, company and enhanced the product with what is called as the PSM or Performance Scaled Messaging Software Interface. Um, this uh, IB product of QLogic was later acquired by Intel and rebranded as uh, Omnipath, which sustained for several years until in Intel declared the product uh, dead and there was a spin-off uh, uh, from Intel uh, and uh, this is currently being pursued by Cornelis Networks and the product is called Omnipath Express and we are working with our uh, Cornelis Networks to provide a support in our MVAPH MPI library for this. So um, one of the interesting features of the Omnipath fabric is the presence of uh, one la layer 1.5 uh, with support for uh, features like traffic flow optimizations, packet integrity protection, dynamic lane switching, so on and so forth. At the layer two, um, Omnipath supports more fabric addresses, uh, like uh, about 24 bit fabric addresses. It also allows for 10 kilobyte of L4 payload. So the max packet size is larger. Uh, and it is also supposed to have a better congestion management capabilities. Um, and uh, just like InfiniBand, it also implements uh, di differentiated quality of service using the concept of virtual lanes and uh, service levels. The major differences is that um, while IB only supported 16 virtual lanes, Omnipath supports up to 32 different uh, virtual lanes. And these are some of the uh, details of how uh, those are working. But as you can see, at a high level, it is still almost uh, uh, like very similar in principle to what IB was doing. Omnipath also has support for partitioning. So to put it in a very loose way, this is similar to the concept of VLANs or virtual LANs in the ethernet uh, uh, world. So you could create a, a partition with the different uh, nodes being part of different partitions, uh, either of one partition or of multiple partitions um, as uh, you want to. And there's all, always a management partition that is defined where all endpoints are members so that you are able to perform management related uh, actions. At the transport layer, there are multiple interfaces that are provided to access the hardware. As I mentioned, there is something called the performance scaled messaging or a PSM interface. And more recently, the Open Fabrics Consortium has uh, uh, proposed the Open Fabrics interface as a better method to access these uh, underlying hardware uh, solutions. So if you look at it uh, with Omnipath Express, OFI is the preferred uh, method of accessing the underlying fabric. And several uh, higher level applications like MPI libraries, file systems, have already been layered on top of the OFI uh, libfabric interface. 
And with this, as Dr. Panda mentioned, we have added another column to the right here, showing how um, the ecosystem looks like. Um, one minor uh, addition that I would like to say is that OFI, if you are talking about verbs, uh, it also exists, like a port of verbs also exists for uh, OFI. So OFI would kind of link to verbs, which would then go to all of these things. Although that implementation is not very performant, that, that is also available. So let's say OFI would be somewhere between here, between the application middleware and the sockets and verbs. So potentially application can go now to sockets, to verbs, to OFI, and OFI can either take you directly to a lower level hardware interface or route you through verbs or sockets to go through any one of these paths. Okay. Now, these are uh, a high level feature comparison of all the different uh, networking technologies we discussed so far InfiniBand, IWAR, High Speed Ethernet, Rocky, Rocky V2, and OmniPath. And as you can see, except for a few uh, differences, mostly they are very similar in terms of features and capabilities. Now, so far we were looking at uh, internode uh, interconnects. Now we'll uh, switch gears a little and look at uh, an intranode interconnect. So we look at NVLink and NV switch, uh, which is what uh, NVIDIA uses nowadays to interconnect GPUs within a compute node. So starting with their Pascal uh, series uh, for the server market, that is when uh, the NVLink interconnect really began to take off in terms of capabilities and performance, as you can see here. There are multiple configurations in which you can have NV links. If your CPU is NV link enabled, like in the case of Power Nines or Power Tens, you can have NV links directly going from the GPU to the CPU, allowing significantly higher bandwidth. So NV links can allow you to uh, allow you as much as 150 gigabytes per second to 300 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. So which is very 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 good. You can also have an uh, NVLink in uh, different kind of uh, uh, network topologies. So each uh, GPU will have six, uh, about four to six different uh, NVLink ports, depending on the generation of the uh, graphics processing unit. So you could have uh, GPUs interconnected in, for instance, like this. This is how the V100 accelerators are connected in a DGX1V server from NVIDIA. So all the GPUs are interconnected, at least most of the GPUs are interconnected using NVLinks directly. Then they are also connected to PCI switches where you have network interface adapters hanging off them. So this is one such way for interconnecting them. But the problem is that, for instance, if you look at this GPU and this GPU, they don't have direct NVLink connectivity because of the limitation of the number of ports. So this is where NV switch comes in. And with NV switch, you now have the capability to create a good intranode communication topologies like you do in your common uh, internode uh, communication networks. So NVSwitch um, has the ability to connect 16 GPUs uh, with an inter-baseboard bandwidth of close to 2.4 terabytes per second, which is 48 links at uh, 25 gigabytes per second uh, uh, in each direction. And each baseboard is uh, fully non-blocking. And um, you can go from any switch to any other switch with just uh, uh, like a, a single hop, um, as you can see here. And you get close to 300 gigabytes per second of GPU to GPU uh, bandwidth, uh, like for intra baseboard communications. So, this um, was one of the first supercomputers in a box, so to speak. So, the DGX 1V architecture or the DGX uh, uh, A architecture, those were uh, the first kind of supercomputers in a box where you had more supercomputing, more computing capability than some of the older top uh, machines on the top 500 list of supercomputers. So next we'll talk about the Amazon Elastic Fabric Interconnect architecture. And uh, many of us don't know this, but still, Amazon has been working on their own fabrics for a long, long time now from C1 uh, range, which was one GBPS to the current C5N, which is close to 100 GBPS. Now, all of you might think, hey, 15 microseconds latency, that's not high performance. Well, in a sense, it is not, but we need to place it in context of Amazon's use case, okay? So Amazon is primarily, or let's say before uh, AWS started, they were primarily an e-commerce company. 
and they wanted to make sure that they did not have to create different data centers or different architectures to host their computing business. So one of their most critical requirements was to be able to balance the communication traffic and use equal cost multi-pathing uh, multi ECMP to make sure that the traffic is spread all over the network and uh, does not create hotspots. So it is because of this requirement that as a design choice, the base small message latency is much higher for the EFA fabric, okay? So the EFA uh, introduced a, a new QPair type, this is called scalable reliable datagram. Now going back, if you looked at uh, the, um, uh, let's say transport types, we looked at dynamic connected and unreliable datagram. So they created a scalable and a reliable datagram where you have the same scalability capabilities as your unreliable datagram, but you have data delivery guarantees. However, initially when uh, SRD came up, there weren't any data order guarantees for either small or large messages. Off late, the, uh, Amazon has introduced newer capabilities inside SRD to enable RDMA features for large messages. So with this, SRD is very, very competitive in terms of features and performance when you compare it to other transport protocols that fabrics like InfiniBand are able to offer you. So at a high level, this is a comparison between unreliable datagram and scalable reliable datagram. So it is quite similar, but for small messages, there could be out of order delivery, uh, which typically doesn't happen with UD that much, but happens quite a bit with SRD, basically because of the requirement to be able to spray the uh, uh, packets throughout the network and go over multiple ECMP paths. And uh, through this, they are able to uh, uh, like make sure that uh, they are able to minimize jitter and tail latency, okay? Um, so let me talk about the Cray Slingshot architecture uh, next. And again, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, talk to me. So uh, this is from a, a uh, set of slides that uh, uh, the uh, CTO, the uh, old CTO of uh, Cray, Steve Scott, had given at uh, Exacom a few years ago, which is a workshop we conduct with the International Supercomputing Conference in Germany. So one of the biggest selling factors for uh, Cray's uh, eighth generation scalable interconnect called Slingshot was uh, quality of service, congestion control, and low tail latency. Okay, it does not have a lot of advanced network offload features, but they do have these three very important capabilities, which uh, uh, let's say arguably allows the fabric to recover quickly from uh, congested scenarios and also to, pro to ensure that different traffic classes are isolated from each other. So the switch is called uh, uh, like Rosetta, and it's a 16 uh, uh, nanometer form factor from TSMC. Uh, it, it has six, 64 uh, ports of 200 uh, Gbps in each direction, and this is a, a high-level uh, view of it. So there's a question, what is the uh, congestion control uh, for uh, SRD? So it is an unreliable uh, datagram packet, so small messages could potentially get dropped, uh, which means that the uh, application is responsible for uh, retransmitting it. Uh, for the last messages, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, I can get back to you offline about that. Thank you. And again, um, coming back to Slingshot, you could interconnect them in different kinds of topologies. So this is one example of how you would uh, connect uh, various compute nodes in a Dragonfly topology with 512 endpoint groups. Uh, in, in the Slingshot um, uh, architecture. So this can potentially scale up to 270, 280,000 network endpoints with just a network diameter of three hops. So that, which is uh, pretty good. And uh, this is uh, a high level description of the kind of quality of service classes that Slingshot offers you. So again, you have support for multiple uh, overlaid virtual networks, Jobs can use multiple traffic classes and uh, thus provide you uh, like isolation for different classes. And the condition uh, management in, in InfiniBand is tracked by the hardware automatically. And uh, based on initial results that we had seen, uh, again, this is not experiments that we ourselves have done, but based on initial uh, numbers from Cray HPE, 
uh, we see that they are able to quickly uh, manage condition and uh, try to uh, mitigate the uh, root cause of it and uh, uh, provide uh, a stability for a variety of traffic patterns across large HPC systems. And they are also able to effectively give performance isolation between applications running on the same network. So with this, we kind of come to the end of the description of various um, uh, modern high performance networks. And uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Panda to talk about uh, the overview of the emerging data center processing units. Um, uh, Dr. Panda, are you, uh, so you are muted. Okay. Can you hear me and yes, uh, perfect. see the slides? Okay. Yes, 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 Dr. Panda. So we are at 107. Yeah, yeah. So, so as you saw this, uh, some of the examples, like uh, we we went over again some of the interconnects, uh, which ones the major ones, which are being primarily used by a lot of systems. Of course, there are other uh, other interconnects and standards. Uh, we don't have time enough time to go over it. But before we go into taking a look at some of the performance numbers and all, uh, we just want to also talk about a little bit about the overview of this the smart NICs. Um, which is you must be hearing uh, quite a lot in the recent years, uh, and and especially in that smart NICs, as the name suggests, you know the NICs are becoming intelligent. I introduced that people have been working towards that from uh, even mid 90s, and one such example we'll take here is the DPU technologies from NVIDIA, but other vendors are working on Intel has its IPU, um, and and many other industries are also working on uh, like APU. Um, all kinds of things are coming up. So how, how many of you, again, uh, we're not getting response, but I'm assuming that many of you know this Bluefield uh, 2, 3 DPU, data center processing unit architecture. So at a higher level, um, this is how the architecture looks like. Okay, you remember I said like hey, people are trying to offload, uh, offload versus onloading, uh, like hey, uh, I think, uh, uh, the omnipath network is actually an onloading that means uh, the the network protocol processing is getting done by the cpu cores instead of the uh, the the network whereas the inferiman was trying to do everything the offloaded now the dpu takes it to an extreme okay so let me tell you how so what it has in this so this is like the traditional inferiman adapter let's say we talked about all this rdma but now, in addition to its own memory, everything, interconnects and all, PCI, now it has a programmable set of ARM cores. Okay, it's with one its memory, it is connected with the PCI, and this is your host server. So it still follows that executive assistant concept I introduced earlier. But now you can think, the idea is that these are all your executives, the processors on the main server, these are your assistant. So you can think of like an office arrangement where five managers are sharing uh, the assistants, okay? And then it might be two or three assistants. Uh, in, this, in this case, it could be like 128 cores are trying to share some ARM cores. And, and these ARM cores, the, they are not as powerful as this. It's just like the day-to-day -day world, am I right? The, the executives are much more powerful, powerful in the sense, not in a uh, power <laughs> um, struggle point of view. I mean, they have more capabilities, they are more learned, learned, so they can do a lot of things. Um, assistants have some limited knowledge. They can do some of the activities, but may not be everything. And this is actually a good system design because you also need to make sure that the power consumption of this adapter is limited. Like uh, when you are plugging a network adapter, you cannot put like 128 core AMD G on there. Okay, As That will be so um, a power requirement or a GPU there, you, you cannot put it. So in this case, it is a Bluefield 3, uh, which has the 400 gigabit speed. And then it has actually 16 uh, cores with 207.5 gigahertz each. It has its also own memory. And they are allowing two different kinds of mode, mode of operation. So either like, let's say this core wants to send some data, it can actually come here and do get some processing done and then send, that is one way. Like as the data is coming in and out, the ARM cores can operate on that on the fly. Or you can think of like a little bit of offloaded. Like a, if we want to do some operation, 
you can give it back to the arm core saying okay you do some further operation and send it back later on okay we'll see some of these examples okay so what they call like a self hosted mode um, and if some of you remember like uh, intel had a uh, knights landing architecture knl uh, if some of you know like uh, many years back uh, that actually died down it was like a self-hosted mode so this is like a it has its own linux driver and everything i can just log on to this and i can actually communicate this also becomes another server and especially in the beginning now in that kind of capability now you can ask question what should i offload okay uh, should i offload computation should i offload communication or synchronization or both people have been so a lot of research is taking place um, recently so in our group we have started working on offloading some kind of things which is called non blocking collective so let me introduce that first and then see what happens so i think collectives are like you know um, reduce all reduce all to all in fact in the morning tutorial those of you are there we focused quite a lot on this all reduce all to all which are getting very prominence uh, for machine learning workload there are two variants of this one is a blocking another one is non blocking so let's say all to all which is very dense communication pattern if i go back here and let's say the application is running her here and then it does a blocking all to all okay so then what happens is of course all to all below all to all there are a lot of algorithms you need to take data from here data from yeah. here mix it send it but then if it is a blocking call the cpus are being involved there they are not making any progress in terms of the application okay some cores might be getting used in terms of implementing that all to all but not all cores are busy okay so there is no real overlap of computation with communication so to exploit this kind of overlapping mpi standard introduced something called a non blocking collectives okay so there is a very nice animation here you will see like let's say if i have four processes so they do some computation now if i want to do all to all i can schedule this okay just think of the real world like let's say a busy executive wants to set up a zoom call with 50 more people okay i mean find out their availability put a when to meet full or uh, uh, find out all the available time and then then schedule the call i mean executive can do it but is it worth his or her time okay so in that case that can be offloaded so that is the whole idea in the non blocking i can schedule that operation or offload that into the some kind of an entity communication entity and then while this is going on the the main process main process or in this case the executive can continue with the computation okay and then periodically it checks whether that operation is is done or not and then once the operation is done it it actually continues with the computation so if i can do this on the real hardware so i can actually try to exploit overlap of computation communication just like what we do in the real world i gave this example the executive doesn't have to worry about scheduling the zoom calls with 50 people see or he can focus on all the computation and then come back then this overhead of all this communication since it is overlap the application will not see it is that clear so that is the 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 broad goal as we are heading into exascale systems and all so the goal is that the computation the units have to remain busy when i say busy i mean you can always do a busy polling that is not the idea they can remain in the computation most of the time for the application so that the communication will be almost free so this idea has been there for many years but the problem has been who will do this this kind of checking completion or communication operation in the there have been some solutions like let's say nowadays we have a lot of cores so i can always let's say 128 cores are there i can take four cores and and indicate that oh you do communication okay but then that is a feasible solution but then for the application perspective you are losing four cores if some application says no i need 128 cores then you cannot achieve that overlap of computation communication so that is the actually the ideal situation where this dpu technology has come one of the things so that means if the dpu technology can actually now perform the operation or progress the communication then i can achieve overall computation with communication 
So in that context, actually, we have taken like from our group, uh, the MAPH MPI library, uh, I think Hari mentioned earlier, we have been working on that project for many years. Uh, we have done research and the actual solution is being actually available through a startup called Xscale Solutions. Um, one can actually contact them to, to, to get a copy of the, uh, of the, this is a licensed product uh, kind of thing. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. So if you take this all to all, like as I mentioned, like a non-blocking all to all, uh, there is a standard semantics. These are in the MPI called I all to all. And there are actually standard benchmarks in our MAPIS project. We have some standard benchmarks. Some of you might have used it called uh, OSU micro benchmarks. So what this measures, not just the communication cost, but compute plus communication cost. Okay, so that's what is being measured. So that means I, I perform some computation, just like in the previous figure, I do the communication and how much time does it take for both compute and communications to be together? That's what it's measuring, okay? So now if you see some of the bars here, so this is like a running for large messages, especially uh, it's a 4K to up to 32K. The, the red bars are actually the MAP is too. The basic MAP is, it, it doesn't have that overlap capability. Whereas if I offload those communication to DPU that non-blocking all to all, now you see, I can get almost like 84% benefit. This is like a 32 node, 32 PPN, like a thousand process run. This is also a thousand process run, even for large messages, like a 512 megabytes and all, I can get 46%. So this is just at a communication layer. But then the question is, okay, what happens to applications? So the, here the idea is that if such hardware is being available, a lot of people are also focusing on co-designing, okay? And, and especially here, the focus is that the, the original application needs to be modified, okay? Um, I mean, that is expected, to think of like a, um, an executive, um, let's say, uh, see or he was at some level of the management uh, and he or she didn't have an assistant. Now he or she got promoted. Um, there's an assistant to help. He or she has to rethink the workflow, day-to-day -day workflow, okay? Uh, to really take the, advantage of the having an assistant, okay? If your C remains in the same workflow, then the assistant will sit idle, okay? That will not give any benefit. So the applications, in this case, we worked with uh, uh, a San Diego Supercomputer Center. Uh, they had this application called P3D FFT. It is a very common P FFT applications, you know, that are very common in the scientific things. So we worked with the developer. So the earlier they were doing a blocking all to all, like a compute blocking all to all, and then again compute. So they rearrange the code to see that, okay, when I'm computing, I am computing actually the data which was communicated in the previous iteration, okay? And then here I can initiate the all to all, but I can continue with the computation for the data which we received in the previous iteration. So it is not easy, but it can be done, okay? It's just like modifying the workload. It, it's just like, you know, um, if you are feeling hungry, the question is, do I order the Uber Eats now and wait for 15 minutes idle without doing anything? Or if I know that, yeah, I'll have a lunch break in half an hour, I order Uber Eats. So while I'm working, the Uber Eats is bringing the food to me, right? So then as soon as like in another 30 minutes, I can eat. It's just a minor modifications to the schedule or the workflow. And that's what we did. And then here, if you see on a 32,000 process runs at an application level, we are able to get 24% benefit. And these are all different grid sizes. So, so like this, we are continuing um, with uh, similarly other collectives, like uh, this is a non-blocking uh, B-cast uh, broadcast. Uh, at a broadcast level, again, if you measure the compute and communication, you get the 63%, 65% uh, kind of uh, benefits. And then what we did is, uh, you know, the high-performance lean pack that is very commonly used, it actually utilizes non-blocking B-cast. So we modified that HPL, and it uses the blocking broadcast in a little bit different manner, but we modified it to take advantage of the non-blocking broadcast, and we have actually an enhanced version of the HPL, and, and you see the benefits depending on the different problem sizes, uh, especially HPL, people struggle to get the performance because you know, like all these top 500 systems are ranked based on the HPL performance. So we can actually boost, is the hardware remains the same. 
uh, if you have DPU access, you can boost your performance by 17%, 7%, 9%. So, so you can actually place your machine not in this rank, but much more higher rank kind of things. Okay. So that's how we are like, I'm just trying to show some initial numbers. We also have accelerated AI workload. We, um, there is another product also called Xscale AI DPU. Um, so you can always go to this company site and then uh, and uh, and and see uh, how this uh, you can actually boost the performance of your applications. Uh, yeah, Amanda, you said uh, neighborhood collectives. I mean, those are all our pipeline uh, in, in the thing. So currently we have only offloaded collectives, non blocking collectives, but very soon the next solution is coming out the point to point operations. And that's what we are trying to offload. And once that point to point is done, uh, then we should be able to do all these neighborhood collectives and all. Okay. Uh, so in another few months, you will see those solutions coming out. Okay. And and at the same time, also we are trying to explore the competition. But the competition again, you have to be a little bit careful because the ARM cores are not that very fast. So so if you expect like the, let's say entire your kernel to come down, uh, then you will get slowed down. Okay. In fact, it may backfire. So we are doing some very um, uh, like a coordinated kind of uh, stuff uh, so that as there might be the, the, the main CPUs are doing some part of the computation and you offload that an, another smaller part to the ARM cores, but they will get done almost at the same time. Okay. So then if we can achieve that, then you will see you will be able to push the performance. So this is a very broad idea of the smart NICs. Um, uh, I think in the Bay Area, you know, there is a smart NIC summit takes place in, um, I think this time it happened in the end of June. Um, so we actually participated there. A lot of other people participated. If you're interested to know, um, please visit the SmartNIC Summit and, and you will get a lot of details like what, what work is going on and all. Um, any questions on this? Okay. So if not, let's go move. We are around like another, uh, 20 minutes or so. So, so we just want to give you a little bit of overview of the software stacks uh, for this uh, network. So, so I touched a little bit of this earlier, like when this beginning of the InfiniBand, when all these new networks were coming, uh, you know, the US Department of Energy, they are the one of the largest users of these uh, HPC clusters. So they started something called an open fabrics. And it was modeled very similar to how the Linux development takes place. You know, the Linux, just like uh, people contribute, uh, continuous testing gets done, and then the uh, the distributors like SUSE, Red Hat, and all, they download and then uh, make some versions out. So this is how it was done. And then once the iWork came, they actually changed that name to Open Fabrics. Okay. And it had actually support for Linux and Windows. It ran, this program ran for many times. And uh, the idea, here, if you see, this is how it was introduced as an open fabric. So it is the verbs interface, which is on the top. And then what happens is every, every vendor, what you can do is you can contribute, let's say, in this case, let, let me take like an Emulex. They actually had, had an adapter. So in addition to their hardware, what they contribute is like a one user level component and one kernel level component, which works with their adapter and it supports verbs. So in that way, actually, this there are multiple advantages. The, the adapter designers can very quickly get plugged to the open fabrics interface so that whatever applications are running here can smoothly run. They don't have to spend a lot of development cycles or manpower resources to have the complete stack ready. On the other hand, the users also has a lot of benefits because if I'm deploying a cluster, I have choices between all these adapters and vendors, and then I can see which one is the most effective, performance cost effective. And, uh, and, and that's how the ecosystem ran for, for many years. This is kind of a, this was a consortium. So a lot of these, you remember we discussed about some STP, UDP and all those things. They came up with a, this complicated software stack. Uh, everybody was following these rules. But then what happened is, as you can go, I, I didn't cover here. This has actually stalled. Uh, so the latest stable release was OFED 4.17.1, uh, 5.3 is in the limbo, okay? Uh, it has not gone ahead, but then what has happened because they were like, you know, the vendors always compete with each other. Uh, so, so there are two software stacks now are being designed. One is UCX, which is being led by 
uh, nvidia melanox primarily uh, so this is a uh, they are trying to have a very tightly designed this ucx with their adapter okay uh, and and then the other consortium which is leading called leap fabrics uh, and that is what they is a part of what they call like a open fabrics interface or ofi and and there is the, the concepts are a little bit very similar uh, but here they have like a different way of designing. That means that the vendor has to have like an OFI provider, uh, which will actually implement. Uh, so currently, if you see like a slingshot uh, or uh, Cornelis network, uh, we, we uh, discussed, they go through the OFI. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the UCX is being now supported through Mellanox, Rocky. So like this, the different vendors, these two camps are emerging. Um, so, so we need to see which which one will continue, uh, and especially with the uh, Wi-Fi provider, the thing what is happening is you don't know what is below. So this is like a provider; they just give you the interface. Uh, so many of these vendors are trying to hide all the details of their network. Um, so if you want to do very low-level designs, you cannot do. Uh, you are only at their mercy of what the Wi-Fi interface um, allows you. Uh, but we'll keep an open eyes on this and then see, I mean, it happens like this every time because different vendors are competing with each other. They want to have the, the market capitalization. Uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. So then this part, I just want to give a very broad perspective again, um, you know, like the networking technologies. If you go to this top 500, uh, there are some historical charts. If you have not seen these kind of charts, you can actually generate these charts. Uh, we just generated and shared. So it shows like historically what has happened. Like this is the Ethernet. Uh, this is where the Infiniman over the years, how it is happening. Then this new interconnects like uh, slingshots and all how it is coming up here. So then if you take a look, this is the latest uh, June 2023. Um, in another two months, we'll get a new link. So what is trying to show on the left hand side is the count. Like out of those 500, how many of these systems are using what technology? And right hand side is like in terms of performance here. So if you combine the performance of all the 500 systems, which systems are trying to, or which technology is contributing to which performance? So, so here, if you see at a very high level, like Infiniman is being used by 40%. And this is a little bit misleading. The, uh, the database only has like a gigabit ethernet, but it doesn't have to be only like a, it is an ethernet, you can say. And the biggest contributor here is actually the number one frontier system. The slingshot is an ethernet system. Uh, even though they have like a proprietary designs, as you saw, they expose that as an ethernet. It's not a commodity ethernet, but that's what actually contributes here. Um, even in the performance case also, you will see. And then there are many other systems. We talked about the Rocky, those systems are also being counted here. Uh, so these are not the traditional ethernet. So all these Rocky traditional ethernet, Slingshot, everything is, is coming here. And this is Ethernet, and then the Omnipath is here. And then these are other some proprietary networks like Fugaku, those kind of the Tofu, uh, those networks. And then if you take a look at it again uh, on the, um, just on the top 500 uh, list, the Infiniman clusters, uh, there is a little bit of discrepancy. We reported these to top 500, um, they didn't answer us back. They report these numbers a little bit differently than here you see is like a 48%, here it is 40%. Uh, but these are the data we, we get from their site. I think their database has some uh, something fishy going on. Um, so so this is what uh, like the on the top uh, 50, uh, you get basically like a 29 systems, as you can see. And in the ethernet, uh, as I said, like a, these are all different uh, speed, even starting from one gig to 25 to 100 to 200. Uh, this is like the frontier uh, I talked about. That is the 8 million cores. So that is the very largest system with Ethernet. There are other systems here um, also coming. And one thing to note, what is happening here, uh, I think since this is a tutorial, and I think it is a, uh, uh, you know, in US, you know, all these election, rigging election, the same thing is happening here, rigging top 500, okay? So what is happening here, if you see, these are Amazon EC2 data center. In fact, these are data center, these need not be in the commodity clusters, okay? But what they do, you see these numbers are very similar, 172, 172, 172. So instead of running a big uh, run with the entire system altogether, 
they may go up, up, but there will be only one entry. Instead of that, they partition into multiple of them and then create four entry. So once the top 500 is announced, then every vendors, manufacturer, they all claim what kind of percentage share they, they have in the top 500. So that's how a lot of manipulations are happening because they exactly know the technology trend. Like for example, people know November, how this trend will happen in the next few months. So they take the machine and then divide it into all these uh, different things. So there is an interesting question here, uh, Giovanni, you put, if the performance of Omnipath is poor, why do companies use it instead of gigabit ethernet? Um, the performance is not actually poor. Um, Omnipath gives very good performance like InfiniBand, latency is one, one microsecond and all. The, the way, because in Omnipath is started with Intel, now it is a kernelist network. And since they have, like a, it is an onloaded protocol I talked about, like their adapter, um, logic wise, it is very simple, okay? They don't have a very offloaded logic. The CPU core is doing the communication, okay? So their adapter is cheap, okay? In fact, many times when they were a part of like a Intel, they were just giving adapters free uh, because it's an Intel. They say, okay, if you buy all these servers, your network will be free. So that's why you see a lot of these installations at universities or even large HPC centers uh, in the medium scale, not at the very big scale. So their onloading is also reasonable because most of the time you are not utilizing all the cores. Um, so if some cores are dedicated for communication, that is okay. So that's how Omnipath, Kernelis network have a reasonable footprint at this time. Does that answer? Okay. No, 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 no. Performance. Okay. So let me explain this. Explain this. So this is the aggregated performance. Let me, it is not an individual performance. So it, what it says, it is a performance share. So if you have the 500 systems, okay. Combine their all performance together. It says, okay, out of those, like this is the total supercomputing power in the world we have. And InfiniBand is controlling 35% of those performance. And, and uh, Ethernet is controlling 46%. So it doesn't say, and only 10% is or 3% is being controlled by one path, okay? So it is not, individual performance is not bad. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so then let's take a look at the actual performance. So that comes to this question. So here, what we'll try to show you just to get a feeling uh, low level performance, that is a network level. And then we'll take one such middleware, which is MPI, and then we'll show you how these numbers come. So let's talk, <clears throat> take a look here. You remember we talked about uh, InfiniMan and Rocky. Uh, the, the adapter is very similar. It is the <clears throat> Rocky is like a ethernet compliant. So this is trying to show like a one way latency uh, for small messages here. And this is for large messages. So here you see at the lowest level, and these are the numbers, by the way, we give all these details. These are taken from my lab. Uh, we can defend all these numbers irrespective of any company. We, we don't do any marketing. These are actual technical number and they can be reproduced. And many of these numbers are actually available on our MAP, MPI library site also. We give all these details, how these were taken. So here, if you see, there is a 130 nanosecond overhead. Infiniman delivers 730. And then since you are converting to the ethernet, so you add some 130 nanosecond. Uh, but in the large messages, you don't see much difference. Same thing happens with the bandwidth. Um, ethernet has the cap um, kind of thing. And then this is like 100 gigabits per second. So Infiniman goes a little bit up. It's a uh, slightly higher difference. And then we talked about all these sockets, R sockets and Infiniman bar. So there is a clear difference. So these sockets here is a pure TCP IP. So now you see, uh, this is like a, uh, it takes around like a, on the same adapter, when you run with a TCP IP, uh, we talked about that IP over IB protocol, which does TCP IP over Infiniman. So it takes around like a uh, six microsecond to send even a small four bytes of data, but on the Infiniman, it comes to 0.73, uh, and then the R socket, we also talked RDM enabled socket. So for small messages and even medium messages, they are able to come together very close to the infinite. Okay. And of course the large messages sockets are uh, not good. The reverse applies to bandwidth. As you can see the TCP IP, the bandwidth is very low. Uh, whereas uh, the, the infinite is trying to deliver the best. And then the R socket, is able to give you also very similar bandwidth. The only difference as we saw in the R socket, it doesn't have all these other features. 
So if your application just needs good performance, um, latency bandwidth in R socket is a good enough uh, to, to proceed. These are some of the numbers of the elastic fabric adapter. As we discussed, the latency is not that good. If you see the on the EF adapter, it's like almost 15 microsecond, 16 microsecond. But the, here the idea is like, this is by design, okay? Uh, the EFA, the way they do it, they are focusing on a very large different kinds of workload. Um, so even though like a, their basic latency is higher, but through congestion control and all, they have much more superior mechanisms and they're able to give you the performance, good performance for their applications, okay? Uh, if you take the same, let's say, HPC application run on an EFA instance, it in May, and if it is a latency sensitive, it will run slower, okay, compared to, let's say, native internet. This is like I was telling, Broadcom has gone to this Rocky uh, standard. So these are some of the numbers. Uh, you get like a uh, infinite low-level things. So it is around at a 3.37 microsecond. This is a Thor 1. Now they are working with the Thor 2 and all, and then we'll see um, how those numbers come out. So the going one upper layer, like this is an API, and I think um, uh, we mentioned many times, this is the, actually the MAPIS project. Uh, uh, we started when Infiniment came in the uh, October 2000, there was nobody knew how to use it. And, and in my group, we were the very first ones to come up with an API library in the world to really work on Infiniment with the greatest performance. We had a demonstration at Supercomputing O2 uh, 20 years back in Baltimore. And we actually showed at that time, it was an eight node Infiniment cluster was running MPI with applications. But over the years, I mean, this is a project which is continuing for 22 years. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, more than 3000 organizations are using now. Um, when I say organization, like let's say TAC or any one HPC center itself is like a organization in 90 countries. Just from our website, we last week we crossed 1.7 million downloads and and our stack is also available with red ads you see open hpc spac uh, we don't keep track of those and over the years we have extended to all hpc interconnect so now our mavis library supports all the interconnects and in the morning tutorial actually even we indicated like based on this mpi we are trying to even provide upper level bridle wires with respect to deep learning machine learning spark dask all those stacks can now run with uh, MPI. And, and also we have been like, these stacks are used. Many of the top 500 systems actually use, their users are also using this. So if you take a look at, again, just using one MPI library, you can reproduce this number with other library. Here we are trying to show some trend. Like uh, these are over the years, we, you know, QDR, FDR, we talked about that, EDR, Omnipath and all. So this is like a MPI level latency. So Broadly, it is around one microsecond, you can think, 1.0104, depending on the processor speed and all, it varies a lot, uh, varies a little bit, uh, but around one microsecond. This is the very latest, like from node to node, you can actually do MPI level communication in one microsecond. And for large messages, uh, the bandwidth matters. So here you see the HDR gives you the best performance because large message I'm trying to send and then the uh, better bandwidth gives me the reduced latency. And this is much more apparent here. Uh, these are like the unidirectional bandwidth, bidirectional bandwidth. And here you can see a clear, uh, like a slab. This is QDR, UDR, FDR. Um, this is the HDR that gives to goes to like a 25 uh, gigabytes per second. If you do multiplication by eight, it's like a uh, 200 gigabits per second. And bidirectional comes closer to 400 gigabits per second. The same thing happens uh, if we see this convergent technology, we talked about the Infiniman and Rocky. Uh, here you see very similar, like earlier we also saw around 130 nanosecond difference at the lower layer, and that gets reflected into the upper layer. Okay, so uh, Infiniman uh, versus uh, uh, the, the Rocky, uh, you will see a little bit uh, difference. And then these numbers were taken back to back, so the switch overhead is not there. So if you add it, actually some switch overhead, then it comes to the previous numbers, um, which were shown in the previous slide. The bandwidth also is very similar kind of things uh, with, with some difference between uh, Rocky and, and Native Infiniman. Uh, we also have support this another network. We didn't go into details. It is called Rockport Networks. Uh, some of you might have heard of it. It is a Canadian company. They have been there for a few years now. Um, so there again, we, we 
uh, our library is starting from this 2.37 series we have been supporting. So it is around three microsecond latency um, in, in, in their network. And uh, this is the very latest slingshot 11 on the frontier. Um, and it goes through Wi-Fi. We have that Wi-Fi design. And in the latest, we have the 3.0 series. So here we see two microsecond uh, on the slingshot. It was taken a little bit few months back. We need to continuously retake some of these numbers. Um, it, it is coming around that range. Might have It might have gone down a little bit now, but it is around two microsecond. And, uh, and the bandwidth wise, again, we are able to saturate that 200 gigabits uh, speed uh, on the slingshot. And this is the, uh, I think it goes back to Johanny, your message. Uh, this is like the Omni, uh, it's a OPX fabric, so it's Cornelius network. Uh, you see the basic communication performance is very good. Uh, it's like a 1.08 microsecond, okay? Um, because they do this onloading, I mean, when you take basic latency bandwidth measurement, you don't see the difference. You need to bring the applications together and then see for the same application, how the different clusters uh, perform, then you will see the uh, difference between offloading and onloading. And this is on the Broadcom Rocky. Um, we had like a 3.37, uh, I believe 3.75, and then in another 100 nanosecond, 130 nanoseconds, this is the MPI level uh, performance on 3.88 microsecond. And on the Broadcom Rocky, we also give like, a, this is a 100 gigabits per second. Um, so we come very uh, close to uh, close to that. So um, we are coming almost to the last five minutes. Are there any questions we can answer? So if not, uh, I can go and um, make the concluding remarks. I mean, it's uh, uh, like for the last three hours, I mean, we started like uh, providing an overview of like a network architecture, the trends in clusters. We presented a background and details of various networks for HVC, went with some of the features. Uh, though the message we would like to give, I mean, it's over the years, so we have been working in this field for last 30 years, continuous enhancements are taking place. Newer architectures are coming, new generation of systems are coming, and uh, people are adding newer features. And then the question is, how do you take advantage of that in the upper layers and work the co-designing? And this is where uh, we will hope to see a lot of innovations coming in the coming years when people are talking about exascale, jetta scale uh, uh, system. Uh, and uh, and with that, um, I'd like to thank all our sponsors. Uh, without their help, uh, would not have been possible to do all these things. But more importantly, uh, these are all my heroes. Uh, this project, especially the MAPIS project, uh, we are running for 22 years now. Uh, and these are all the past students, current students, and many of them, if you look at the names, they are actually in very top companies, working as an architect and all uh, in the field. Uh, but uh, every time we present this, uh, I would like to contribute. Uh, I'd like to recognize their contribution and salute them. And we are building on, on top of this. And these are our uh, pointers. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to um, um, ask us by email. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, supercomputing, uh, we have been giving, I, I have not kept counting. This must be the 150th edition of this tutorial. We continuously change for every offering. Uh, we'll also be offering this at supercomputing uh, with a little bit more time. We'll have some hands-on. If, uh, if you feel uh, uh, some of your colleagues will get benefited or you will get benefited more, please ask them to join our tutorial and we'll go into more details, okay? Uh, we are almost at the end, uh, two more minutes. I see a chart here, uh, Giovanni were saying, do you have graphs that compare the performance on the same axis, uh, like a scatter plot or bar chart uh, across different interconnects? Is that what you mean? Okay. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> we don't do that. Um, the, the reason being, we, we become a political target, okay? Uh, because when you do this kind of numbers, you know, somebody wins, somebody loses. And uh, unless you have it in a very, very, I mean, some of these numbers we have taken on different platform because all the uh, software, communication library, all these things don't work together. Uh, so then some people uh, just, we, we become like a indirectly become like a target of some, some people say, yeah, these numbers are good. Some other people start getting us. Okay, so the, the best assumption will be you can actually do your own evaluation. 
and and then see what is what is best for you okay now i know you are referring to spec uh, there are kind of newer standards are coming up but you need to get an equal that is the that is the difficult thing you see let's say i have a cluster uh, which has infinimat i only have like a two nodes with broadcom i don't have like a 64 nodes with each 128 cores connected with infinimat as well as rocky as well as this if somebody gives me such a system, we can do this, these numbers, okay? Um, but, but otherwise it is very difficult to, to get a uh, uniform numbers. There will be some variation, some, some might be some is running uh, like a operating system or some driver 5.1, somebody is running 5.2, there could be some differences. Okay, so the question is like, what is your take on the GPC net? Yes, so that GPC net has been there like to, to measure the congestion and all. I think it got some good uh, traction, but I think uh, might be Hari can uh, add. In the last last year, at least, I am not seeing that, that kind of a traction yet. So in general, GPC net is uh, meant for a particular purpose, measuring the... Uh, um, ability for a network to recover from congestion. So um, people are using it. Uh, it. It was developed by Cray and uh, they submitted it to SE as a paper. Uh, people are using it, but um, I'm not sure whether uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, for instance, supercomputing centers are using GPC net uh, to measure the congestion uh, qualities of the network. So um, I at least uh, the HPC centers that we have been working with have not, uh, uh, let's say, used it so far. Yeah, then the question was HPC simulator. Actually, the, on the MPI level, we have standard benchmarks. You can actually download. Uh, that is a standard. Uh, we issue micro benchmarks for MPI. Please go to the MAPI site. Uh, and people actually compare that. In fact, those tests are part of the procurement, actually. It's a, all over internationally. Uh, MPI level evaluation, they always refer to those standards. We have done it at the MPI level, but not at the lowest level. Okay. Okay, so with this, I think um, it has been a long day. Uh, I know some of you were in the morning, uh, also in the afternoon tutorial. Uh, there is, oh, I think some more tutorials are continuing. So I hope you'll join those and uh, have a very productive uh, hot interconnect. And I look forward to meeting some of you in person if you are coming to supercomputing or some of the future events like SmartMix and all. Thank you. Thank you all.